I recently had my very first sighting of a cryptid. I was working at a national forest as a park ranger and got the job temporarily full time. I was to replace a maintenance worker for a couple of weeks while he went away on vacation. In the meantime, I got up bright and early to go out on a run, come back to the cabin I currently live in at the campground, and got dressed for work. A couple of days before the incident at hand, I ran into a young woman as she was leaving her campsite. She said that she had just arrived and woke up to a strange noise in the middle of the night. I find myself driving down a lower road used for maintenance workers, and I approached a clearing with a dirt berm on one side. It is there that I hit something with my truck, and it nearly threw me out of my seat. Once I regained composure, both mentally and physically, I hopped out of the truck to see what it was. What appeared before me was not man-made, at least not by human hands. Jumping back into my truck, I did a quick three-point turn and went back to camp. It was there that I grabbed my rifle from the cabin door, strapped it into the gun rack in the truck, and drove onto the dirt berm. As I got out of the truck, at about 100 yards from where I hit it, whatever it was was now standing up on two legs with its arms held straight up in the air, like it was reaching. My first thought was that this was a wee wolf or some sort of Bigfoot. I did what anybody would do in this situation. I raised my rifle and fired one round directly at the thing's head. The bullet hit true right between the thing's eyes, killing it instantly. Standing there for a few seconds, looking around, thinking just how lucky I was that nobody else had come across this thing, only to get back in my truck and go about my day. That night after work, when I got back to camp, I took a shower before dinner. The next day, when I got to work, my co-worker came to ask me if anybody else saw what I hit the other day. Of course, I asked why he wanted to know. He told me an officer from the sheriff's department stopped by and was asking if anybody had gone to that clearing and hit anything with their vehicle. When I told him about my incident, he told me he would talk to the officer for me. I have a bad feeling about this. Telling my story has gotten easier to think about over the years, but the end of this incident was the hardest thing for me to accept as fact. I've told one person for thirteen and a half years. I'm anxious already, but here it is. I'm doing this now mostly to get it out of my head and off my chest. Thinking about it sometimes gives me anxiety. I don't know how people talk about these experiences. It was so unexpected. I have been hunting black tailed deer in Washington State for more than 30 years. This was a great day for hunting, with hard rain and gusty winds. I was boat hunting and heading to my area. It's just over six miles away. I made it to my tree, took up my pack, and started to prepare my tree. I was ready to toss the rope over a branch when I heard a deep-voiced child crying out. It sounds completely nuts, but it's 100% true, and it's the only way I can explain it. It sounded like a deep-voiced child. No words, just moans and crying. As soon as I heard someone needed help, I grabbed my pack and bow and headed in that direction with urgency. It is much farther than I originally estimated. There was an old overgrown logging road with some trees broken and bent down on the side. I guess the hole was naturally created on this road. The heavy rain pooled up in an area and sunk in around seven feet deep. It was such an abrupt fall I worried about sliding in. As soon as I arrived, I announced I'm here. It's going to be okay. I tied the rope to a tree. It stopped making childlike cries. All I heard was an off and on slight moan like an odd hum. I continue to believe it was just a first season young hunter that was extremely scared, maybe injured. It's okay, kidda. My name is Tony. What's yours? I tied off my tree hoist and tossed it. Then, as soon as I released the rope into the hole, all hell broke loose. I'm getting goosebumps right now. It was crazy. The trees, less than ten yards away, swayed and some snapped off. Then a horrifying growl started. With a deeper growl, it was exactly like an angry bear. I pulled up my 10 millimeter from its holster and slid on my butt in reverse. 
I just knew that a large black bear would sprint out of the trees any second. I had a flashlight in my pocket. I pulled it up and held it down into the hole while pointing my ten mile at the trees. I was so confused when I saw it. I began to feel like this couldn't happen. I started to think I was losing it. Then I got my first look at what I thought was a child. It was a child, but not a human. I panicked, fell backwards, dropping everything, including my tin mile. I quickly crawled forward, scratching the earth for my pistol. My heart was beating so hard that I thought a heart attack was coming. I could hear my heart beat. I estimated it was just over five feet tall with hair all over it. There was mud and debris knotted to its hair. It was clearly scared and was slightly limping on its right side after it exited the hole. The adult in the trees was very tall, with more hair and wider shoulders. They walked away. I sat in the same spot, three feet from the sinkhole, with mud all over me and my pistol sitting on my lap. I just had to catch my breath. I couldn't understand that these animals were real. Later I returned home and knew if I didn't come back I would never hunt again. I went back the next day. I just stayed on the road the whole time. My hands shake a little. I didn't hunt. I just looked around. Then I relaxed a bit. I came around the corner on the logging road, and right in the middle was my tree seed and two other things I dropped on my way out. Then I noticed they left pine cones for me. Grass and branches were also stacked. I think they wanted me to have it. I honestly don't know for sure but it was directly on top of my stuff and assembled deliberately. Thanks for letting me get this off my chest. I've been afraid to speak of this all these years, though my wife knows about it. So I wanted to tell a story that happened to me and my grandma. So basically, my family owns a piece of land near, quote, Redacted Lake. Not a big piece of land, but it's enough to fish at. So basically, my grandma and I were out on that piece of land. Our land is covered by trees. So we were having a fun time fishing when we heard a sound. Now I know a sound in the forest. Wow. But it kind of freaked us out, so we started packing up. We packed up and started heading to our car. At that point, it was turning dark. At that point, we hear a scream or like a howl those sounds that they make on finding Bigfoot. It came from out left in the woods. We were shocked and just stood there. At that point, to our right, we hear another howl, and then another from behind us. At this point, my grandma and I start bolting to the car. We just drop our fishing supplies and bolt it. We make it to the car and just reverse as fast as we can and drove out of there, probably breaking the speed limit. Located in southwest Pennsylvania, my story unfolds in Washington County. I live near Washington, Pennsylvania. There has been a variety of mysterious creatures and other strange animal encounters reported in this area for a long time. New home construction seemed to be causing these creatures to seek refuge in the surrounding woods. One creature seen in the area is a large wolf-like animal. While little is known about this elusive creature, reports suggest that it possesses traits similar to both wolves and other large animals such as bears and mountain lions. But some people also claim that it has human-like qualities and features, which is what I feel is the most disturbing part of its existence. I've lived my whole life in this area. When I had my encounter, everything changed. I work as a freelance writer and researcher. It was early morning on January 1, 2012. I had just gotten out of bed after staying out longer than I had wanted at a New Year's Eve party. I was mad at myself for sleeping in and getting ready for my day when I heard this loud noise coming from outside. When I looked out the window, I was shocked to see a large, wolf-like creature standing in the middle of my backyard. The creature didn't match anything I'd seen before. However, it looked like the creature I had heard stories about all my life. It was easily twice the size of a normal wolf, but had human-like features such as its eyes and feet. The mouth was sliding gape, showing its sharp teeth. 
The menacing beast was just standing there staring back at me as I watched it through the window. I didn't know how it knew I was there, and I couldn't figure out what to do about it being in my yard. I stared back at it, trying to figure out what this creature was. The truth is that I was a bit excited to see it. I mean, this was the culmination of all of my childhood fantasies and dreams about strange creatures. It was almost a surreal moment for me. But after standing there for quite some time, the creature finally turned and ran off into the woods. Without a second thought, I grabbed my coat and rushed outside to try and follow it. But by the time I got there, it had disappeared into the trees. I stood in the same spot it had stood in, but could not see anything out of the ordinary. I looked around, but there were no footprints, so it seemed necessary to walk over to where it entered the woods. As I approached the edge of the woods, I was shocked by a sudden, loud howling. I was now scared and felt like I had pushed too far. I started to slowly work my way toward my home, hoping that the creature would just leave me alone. But as soon as I left the woods, it let out a loud growl and then lunged out of the thick cover. I turned 180 degrees from the creature and ran for my life. I reached my house and closed the back door behind me. But the creature was right there as it smashed into the door, shattering the glass and sending splinters of wood flying through the air. But it didn't get through the door. It stood steady and stayed in place. I was now in the kitchen and grabbed a knife in case it found its way into the house. But by the time I turned to look, the creature was gone. It was as if it had vanished into thin air. I was left standing and wondering what to do next. I called the police and reported the encounter. Over the next few hours, there was a search for the creature, but it was never found. At least that's what the authorities said to me. They told me there was nothing to worry about. The next day, a crew of some sort showed up with cameras and what looked like detectors. However, I have no idea who they were or what they were doing. For me, the creature will always remain a mystery, a sign of something more out there in the world. It's as if I got a glimpse of what could be lurking in the shadows waiting for the next chance to strike. That reminder is enough to keep me on my toes for the rest of my life. Terrifying as it was, I'm actually grateful for that encounter because it validated a lot of my life's interests. This incident occurred in November 1991 near Falmouth, Kentucky. It was early afternoon. I worked on a 160-acre farm at the time. One day, while eating lunch with a friend, I was told that hunters sneaked onto the property. I finished lunch, got my gun, and walked down the fence row. I planned to cut into the woods and sneak up on them. I had been out there for around 45 minutes to an hour and was walking through the woods when suddenly something stepped out from behind a tree. I yelled, friend or foe, and pointed my gun at it. I couldn't believe my eyes, because they're standing in front of me and my gun was a three half foot tall, unknown, gray colored being. Suddenly I felt the being talking to me telepathically. I had the feeling that it was a young female and it was scared and telling me it was planning to run up a small knoll. Then it ran up that hill. I followed it. Then there was a flash of light and a portal or door opened out of nowhere. It was about four feet wide and eight feet tall. There was a bright light inside and I could see that it was filled with a small being. Now it looked like it was wearing a tight-fitting black suit of some sort. Suddenly, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw what looked like something running towards me. I wheeled around, and right in front of me was a lizard-like humanoid about five to six feet tall, and it held a long staff in one hand. The humanoid's face was more insect-like and had blue eyes. Again, I felt it was the small female being's father or guardian. At this point, and to my right, a seven or eight foot tall, brown, hairy, bigfoot-like creature instantly appeared standing nearby. I didn't hear it speak, but I heard in my mind, no, don't hurt him. Just then the lizard-looking humanoid looked right at me, and its eyes changed to yellow gold. I then ran. When I did, I suddenly found myself alone in the woods, and it was nighttime. I stood there in shock for a moment, trying to collect myself. 
I then walked back to the farm. Once I arrived at the farmhouse, I found another farmhand that said he thought I was lost, as they had been looking for me. I didn't say anything about my encounter. It's been 32 years since that incident, and I've never experienced anything like that again. New hunting camp, first year in, peak of the whitetail rut, and my dad has to head back early for work. I was 16 at the time and really wanted to stay and hunt. Friend of my dad offered to drive me back three days later. Sweet. That night the guys decided to watch the movie Congo. If you've never watched it, major premise of the movie is an expedition party getting torn to bits by genetically modified apes in the jungles of Africa. After the movie, my dad's buddy explains that he has the perfect spot for me to hunt tomorrow. It's a raised levee in the middle of a swamp. A natural funnel that should have plenty of deer crossing in the uh, ME. Only issue is it's about a one quarter mile walk through waist deep water to get there. But he has a pair of chest waters I can borrow. With a smirk he says. Unless you're too scared to hunt there after watching that movie. Of course I'm not going to admit I'm freaked out a bit. So calmly say it's no issue. Next morning with a smirk he drops me off in the middle of this swamp. Tells me he'll be back to pick me up at 11 a.m. As the taillights disappear through the cypress trees, I contemplate just sitting down and hunting the road. That movie did mess me up and trudging waist deep through this swamp, following a questionable bright eye trail with my dim headlamp, doesn't sound great. I muster up courage and start trudging in, though. Just as I'm about halfway in, waist deep, every step a challenge due to sucking mud. I hear the most ungodly noise. My mind must be playing tricks on me. There are no monkeys in Alabama. Another hundred yards in, and I hear it again. This time closer and very clear. My God! It sounded like a gorilla. I'm now doing my best to run through sucking mud. Gorilla noises coming from the trees all around me. I'm literally yelling. There aren't monkeys in Alabama, over and over at the top of my lungs. Just as quickly as the noises came, they left. I did eventually find a stand. The next four hours were me clutching my rifle, safety off drawing on every little noise I heard in the woods, contemplating my sanity over what I'd just experienced. Honestly, the walk back through the swamp might have been worse, whole time scared out of my mind, wondering if I should even speak about what I experienced. I meet them on the road at 11. Instead of it just being the one guy, it's actually everyone in camp in one truck. I didn't say anything, but the look on my face must have conveyed my experience. They immediately start laughing their asses off and ask to hear my story. As I start telling the story through their belly laughing, I am now convinced they played a trick on me and were hiding in the trees waiting to scare me. I'm telling them they should be glad I didn't blow one of their heads off. The truth is actually much stranger. Yes, it was a setup from the get-go, but it wasn't them in the trees. History is a bit murky on how they got there. Some say it was released pets. Some say it was a previous landowner who released them on purpose. But there was actually a troop of uh, howler monkeys that lived in that swamp. They had discovered this on accident, but had been waiting to pull this prank on someone like me for years. They still laugh about it every time they see me. I agree it was a good prank, although it messed me up for a while. Go watch a YouTube video on what howler monkeys sound like. Now imagine yourself in a swamp, up to your waist, feet stuck in mud, mind fresh with vivid images of gorillas ripping people's heads off. In the 90s, I was on a week-long backpacking trip with my uncle in the Colorado high country. He was a professional rock climbing, trail guide at the time, so he knew his stuff while off. Grid. The second day in, we were following some old trail that hadn't been groomed in years and came across the outskirts of some random commune deep in the woods. We knew there were people there because we could see campfires and laughing or talking in the distance. 
My uncle immediately freaks out, tells me to keep quiet, and then made us backtrack nearly five miles and then around. It was the first and only time I've actually seen him panic off the grid. Afterward, he lectured me that it was some kind of small sect or cult that had a rep for being very territorial in the area at the time and was known to shoot at trespassers without provocation. I've been a hunter all my life so it was supposed to be a routine grouse hunt, just me in the tranquility of nature, but as I ventured deeper into the woods, the atmosphere changed. The trees grew denser and sunlight struggled to penetrate the canopy, leaving me in an eerie, darkened realm. My instincts urged me to turn back, but something pushed me forward. Curiosity, perhaps, or a hint of excitement in exploring the unknown. With each step, I felt the forest closing in around me, its silence broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or the distant cry of a bird. Little did I know that my journey was about to take a surreal and terrifying turn. As I followed the winding path, I suddenly caught sight of a massive figure in the distance. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. Towering at least nine feet tall, with wide shoulders and muscles rippling beneath its stringy hair, the creature moved with a grace that defied its size. Its long arms swayed rhythmically, and its powerful thighs propelled it forward, like an ancient predator prowling the shadows. Trying to comprehend what I was witnessing, my mind fumbled for words to describe the monstrosity before me. A half-gorilla and half-neanderthal man-type animal was the closest I could come to describing its unsettling features. It had hardly any discernible neck, and its head tapered to a cone. Like point, the creature's presence exuded raw power and primal intelligence, making me acutely aware of my own vulnerability. Fear and adrenaline surged through me, but my hunter's instincts kicked in. My heart pounded as I aimed my rifle at the creature, steadying my breath to take the shot. I had to protect myself, but more importantly, I needed to know what this creature was, where it came from, and what it meant for the natural order of things. With a deep breath, I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed through the forest, and I watched the bullet hurtle towards the unknown beast. For a split second, it seemed like my bullet had found its mark but my hope was crushed as I saw the projectile bounce harmlessly off the creature's skin. It was as if the skin was made of some impenetrable armor, rendering my weapon useless. The creature didn't even flinch. It stared at me with eyes that seemed to pierce my very soul. But before I could react further, it vanished into the forest, blending seamlessly with the shadows. I stood there dumbfounded and perplexed unable to process what had just transpired. Nothing in my hunting experience could explain what I had encountered. Was this some ancient, mythical creature long believed to be extinct, or had it emerged from the depths of the earth itself, a harbinger of a new and untamed era? As I made my way back to civilization, the forest felt different, changed. The woods that had once been familiar and comforting now held secrets that sent shivers down my spine. I shared my bizarre encounter with fellow hunters and researchers, but most dismissed it as a figment of my imagination or an exaggeration. It was 2014 and I was eight years old. I don't remember the exact month, but I'm pretty sure it was December. Strange things had happened in the house in the previous days. Strange shadows and continuous nightmares while I slept, which is why I always slept with my mother that year. I don't remember the exact date it happened. However, that evening my father was working the night shift, so my mother and I were home alone. My mother was sleeping next to me, and I woke her up telling her there was something in the corridor because I heard noises. She said it was just the wind and turned back to sleep. I couldn't sleep, and after the umpteenth noise, I opened my eyes. In front of me, to the side and in front of the cot where my mother slept, was a gray figure 
with thin legs and thin arms. It held up one arm to indicate something with the hand parallel to my mother's face, which was turned onto the back of the bed. I closed my eyes, hoping it was a nightmare. Then I opened them again, and it was still there. Lying in bed, it seemed to reach up to the door handle, which is next to my bed. So it was not higher than 60, 70 centimeter. Perhaps it really was taller, and it was because of the perspective that it seemed short to me. At that point, I closed my eyes, and now that I think about it, stupidly enough, I reached out to try and feel that thing. I wanted to see if it was real, or if I was dreaming. My hand touched something sharp and cold, and I spun around, closing my eyes. I don't know if what I touched was the thing or the metal frame of the cot, but I think it was the frame. A few minutes later, I turned around and opened the thing was gone, so I figured it was all a dream, and then decided to sleep. Suddenly, inches from my nose, a round gray thing appears in front of the headboard. I start to scream, but no sound comes out of my mouth, so I blink and the round thing is gone. I try to fall back asleep and succeed, but I don't know if I was abducted afterwards or if it was all a figment of my imagination. After that, still in that period, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, when I was trying to fall asleep, I remember that my father was also in the house. I heard a voice saying, Ah, food. I never understood what it was. Over the years, I've thought several times that it was my father who watched something on the phone before falling asleep. However, I couldn't close my eyes all night. Three other similar cases have occurred. Once I saw a dark shadow breathing heavily beyond the door that separates the living room and the corridor, which is made of opaque glass. Another happened the following year, when I was changing in my room and I heard a growl from the corridor... I immediately closed the bedroom door without reopening it until my parents arrived. The last one happened two years ago after I fought with my father. While I was alone in the room, I jokingly said, Aliens, can't you kidnap him for a few days? And I received a hoarse and disturbing no as an answer. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I didn't just see shadows. Three years ago in August, while I was in the courtyard at about four in the afternoon, I saw a gray figure materializing out of nowhere. The figure trudged a few steps in wide strides before disappearing after stepping onto the first step to ascend up to the house. It was slightly shorter than a person, with long arms and legs. I remember it had four fingers, and it stared at me before vanishing. I will never forget that look. A white toothed smile and almond eyes. My folks were next to me, looking in the same direction, but they saw nothing. When I told them what I'd seen, they said it was just a trick of the lights. I also was touched, and perhaps about to be kidnapped. At the age of ten, something grabbed my head and dragged me out of bed. I woke up screaming and putting my hands on my head. I had time to touch a pair of wrinkled hands before my parents woke up, and the hands let me go. My parents came to see what had happened, finding me on the floor, groggy. They told me it was just a nightmare, but I'm sure it wasn't. I had the last experience last August on a Wednesday at midnight or noon. I watched Netflix on my computer while playing games on my phone. The light from the computer quickly illuminated a hand seemingly connected to nothingness, trying to touch me just above my left knee. Without telling my uh, sleeping parents and without shouting, I turned on the lights immediately, but whatever it was, was gone. My mother had similar experiences to the first I related to. Once she saw a short, huge-headed humanoid figure spying on her and my uncle from the front door to their bedroom. The second time, a similar figure spying on her from behind a radiator on the corner on the way to my grandma's sister's house, which is attached to my grandma's by a corridor full of windows. He never told me when the second happened, but the first happened at night. Another thing about my mom is that she always sees a black figure before a family member dies. She says it's death, and I believe her. He saw her before my great-grandfather passed away, then before my great-grandmother passed away, and last time in 2020, one at the end of May, about a week before my grandfather died of a heart attack. 
My grandmother and her sister also had weird experiences. Shortly after my grandfather's death, from the corridor going to my grandmother's sister's house, for a few nights, they saw a bright red dot floating in the sky. It rose above the horizon, moving up to the chimney of the house closest to them, to then rise into the sky and disappearing over my grandmother's house. I don't know why they never took pictures. They say it was a drone or a Chinese lantern, but I don't think a Chinese lantern takes the exact same route some nights in a row. Maybe it really was a drone, though, but not having seen it, and the two of them not being very adept at identifying modern technology, I can't be sure. My grandmother's sister had the last experience I want to tell you about back in 1960. She never told me the exact year or month. At the time, she was still living in Ojit, Camasco, Italy, the birthplace of my mother's maternal branch, with my great-grandmother. She was coming home from work, and night had just fallen. To get home from where he worked at the time, she usually passed through a wood that has now been replaced by a few houses. On the dirt road, he punctured a wheel on the bike he usually used to travel there. A few minutes after she started shuffling behind her bike, she saw lights in a clearing, and never scared easily she approached. A similar event had also happened a few days earlier, but it was explained as the lights of a demonstration or a disco theek that opened in a small village near his home, whose name I don't recall. And I don't know if it still exists. What he found in the clearing, however, was a series of stationary lights, within which other series of lights spun in opposite directions. These lights then suddenly turned off. When she got home, my great-grandmother asked why it had taken so long. My grandmother's sister, looking at the watch on her wrist, saw it was 11.30 p.m. This is when she normally gets home around 9 p.m. She told my great-grandmother everything, but I don't know what happened next. She never wanted to know what had happened to her. Near where my grandmother and my grandmother's sister grew up is Lake Como, Italy, and several times they have seen what they call heat lightning, basically ball lightning, and they said that the red ball they saw wasn't a ball lightning because it lasted too long and was always the same, and my aunt said it's impossible for so many and as big as the lights she had seen in the 60s to form. I live in the suburbs of Abbiacagrassa, province of Milan, Italy. This is located just next to the Ticino Triangle, perhaps the hot spot with the most UFO sightings in northern Italy. Nearby are the Camry military base and the state powder magazine in Romando. So... I don't typically believe in this kind of stuff, but I had a very strange encounter a while back. I told my co-workers about it, and they insisted I had seen a rake. I've been researching since I had no idea what it was. It looks very similar to what I saw, except it's a fictional creature from a creepy pasta. Just learned about that, too. So I'm not sure what I saw. Anyway, I was driving home from work about a month or so ago and headed down this typically busy side street in Douglas County, Colorado, called Havana. It's close to Centennial Airport in a business district surrounded by apartments. It was about 1, 30 a.m. and there wasn't much traffic, just a jeep in front of me. As I drove around a bend in the road where Dry Creek turns into Havana, I saw in my peripheral vision a figure to my right on the sidewalk standing between two small trees held up by wire supports. The creature stood kind of behind them. At first glance, I figured it was just a tall, slender dog, like a white greyhound or Great Dane. It escaped and seemed to bark at traffic on the sidewalk. I was traveling about 45 miles per hour when I passed and it was dark out but I noticed as I passed by that it appeared to have a humanoid-shaped head with black eyes. It also had a bent over hunched back, long slender legs, and an unusually wide mouth like it was screaming or something. I thought to myself, yo, what was that? So I slowed down quickly to look back, and in my mirror, 
I saw the creature turn around and run off towards a fence or brick retaining wall on the other side of the sidewalk. But as it ran off, I saw how tall and slender the creature was. It seemed very pale, almost gray with an anorexic and bony appearance. It also moved strangely where its hind leg joints were inverted and bent in the opposite direction from its front legs. At that point, I was seriously creeped out. The jeep in front of me had also slowed down, so I could only assume they saw it too. We both continued driving as it was late or early and couldn't stop in the middle of a busy road. However, that situation really made my skin crawl. I checked my mirrors for the rest of the drive home. I debated if I should call a non-emergency line to have an officer check it out, but I told myself they would think I was an idiot. Now, every night when I take that road, I look around to see if I can spot it again. I really want to believe it was just a dog. However, I can't stop thinking about how strange and quickly it moved with its backwards knees and how long or wide its mouth stretched. I haven't talked about this much except to some family and my co-workers because, frankly, it sounds ridiculous. I'm wondering what I saw. And if it's something I should talk about, or should I pretend I never saw anything and move on with my life? I like exploring derelict houses. There is a lot of development where I live, so there are a few empty houses awaiting their fate at any given time. Right now, I can think of four within walking distance of my house. One night, I visited an old farmhouse from the 1850s. It was in quite good condition, but sadly was about to be demolished for a new housing estate. I usually go alone, but this time I brought my wife with me to see if she would like it. I had briefly been in the house before, but wanted to go back to have a proper look for anything I could save before the bulldozers arrived, so I was carrying a pry bar. I'm always cautious that I could disturb squatters or vandals. It hasn't happened yet, and I have been in at least 50 houses, so I did a quick look through the house and propped a chair behind the front door as the lock mechanism had been taken. The side door was open, but I figured that if someone walked in that way, I would hear the crunch of the broken glass on the floor. We were standing in the kitchen, and we clearly heard footsteps walking through the dining room towards the kitchen. My wife freaked out, so I held the pinch bar up and walked towards the dining room door, saying, Yes, can I help you? Which I figured was defiant enough to let whoever it was know that I wasn't scared of them, which may or may not have been the case. The dining room was empty, the noise stopped, and the only sound I could hear was the flapping of the roller blind in the wind due to the broken window. See, it was just the blind, I said, banging the blind against the window, to prove my point. The wife was not convinced and practically dragged me out of the house. We jumped in the car and she locked the doors. It wasn't the blind, she said. It sounded different. I heard footsteps. She was right. I later went back to the house alone and returned with some nice French doors which, after a lot of restoration work, are now part of my own house. Weeks later, Carinha Cottage was demolished in a zero salvage demolition and replaced by 97 tiny new houses, all of which looked the same. Back in the late 80s, my father was stationed at a base in Central California that is no longer an active base, but all the building and housing are still there, but it's all private now. Mind you, I was about six years old when this happened. One day, my father became ill and was rushed to the hospital. They found that one of his intestines had ruptured. Doctors were baffled as to the cause, but regardless, they saved his life. After a couple of weeks in the hospital in recovery, he came home to our on-base duplex. Next-door neighbor heard about what happened and was actually shocked. Said that the same thing has happened to at least three other people that lived in that exact unit. Three that he knew about anyway. We had only lived there for less than a year before my father's incident. Strange thing is, no one else in our household was affected or had anything similar happen. 
The past tenants that the same thing happened to were also all the enlisted party of the family. No one else in the house and all families had problems with a ruptured intestine. All four people this had happened to were all in the time frame of about five years. The other weird part about it is that all three people had different jobs, so this didn't appear to be an occupational hazard at all. One was an office worker, my father, and two others did work on aircraft, but my father did come now. Now, if one was a fuel troop, and not sure about the other. So exposure to some chemical or environmental event doesn't seem to be the factor in this. The base housing was built in the early to mid-1940s. It's now low-income housing. But it only really appeared to be our unit that had anything like this happen. Coincidence. Something about the house that would cause this. Not sure, but it does strike me as odd. I work as a field biologist, and this last summer I had what I would call my closest experience with the paranormal. We would drive around on a TVs all night with spotlights looking for prairie chickens. One night my boss and I were working together. Our co-workers were at another site about five miles away, and we'd made plans to meet up if either of our groups finished up in our respective areas. Anyways, it's about four o'clock in the morning, very dark out, and my boss and I both noticed the grass on a hilltop opposite us was illuminated, as though someone had parked their truck on the other side and turned their brights on, lighting up their side of the hill. It was coming from the direction and general distance our trucks were from us, so my boss and I decided to head that way, assuming our co-workers were meeting up with us. We drive the half mile to the hilltop when we finally crest, all we see are the reflectors of our parked trucks in the distance. No lights, no vehicles, nobody nearby. Mind you, we were working in incredibly remote areas in Wyoming. The roads in and out were treacherous. There's no possible way someone snuck a truck in and out to spook us without us seeing them. This was prairie. We could see everything around us for miles. We saw that light, but now it was nowhere to be seen. Anyways, that was weird. Someone sketchy is walking around my neighborhood, which is in a semi-large town, 44,000s. And we don't live in the best neighborhood. Not sure what they are up to, but I thought I heard someone walk by me a few times, but couldn't see anyone. I was outside gardening low. It was 12.30 a.m. Then I took a call from my daughter. In order to not wake everyone, we have thin walls and neighbors close by, I started walking away from the houses towards this large, empty lot. As I'm walking, I thought I heard a noise, so I turned around and started heading back towards my house and saw this shadowy figure holding a super tiny light of some kind. As soon as they saw me turn around and start walking back in their direction, they ducked behind this big bush. I made a comment to my daughter that someone moseyed on behind this big bush real quick in front of me, but still thought maybe they lived at the house the bush was in, and that they were cutting through to a back door or something. But a few seconds after I said that to my daughter, the person hopped out from behind the bush in an almost exaggerated fashion and started walking directly towards me. Not sure what the hell that was all about, but I didn't stick around to find out. I cut through the empty lot at a diagonal to get back to my house. Update. I was really on edge after that, but trying to finish moving some flowers I had already pulled. I was working on the front side of my house. The house is on a semi-busy street and the same one the person had come from before hopping into the bush. As soon as I was done with the front, I went to the side of the house because I had about ten plants I was relocating. I was already thinking that whoever it was before, if it was me they were after wouldn't know I had moved to the side and might be more comfortable walking right by again. About ten minutes after I'm on the side, I see a guy walking really slow down the sidewalk directly in front of my house. He scared the shit out of me because he was only about 10 feet from me when I saw him and I even said he had scared me to death. 
He stopped and said, well, at least I got a chuckle out of you then. Then he proceeded to ask how I was doing tonight. I was polite, but short, and just said I was doing good thanks. I didn't even ask how he was doing in return because it creeped me out that he had stopped to talk to me at this time of night. He then continued walking to the end of the block, which is also where our lot ends. We are on a corner. I have some hedges that run parallel to the sidewalk and go from the spot I first noticed him and continue to the end of the lot. The guy keeps walking until he has passed the hedges, then turns around to look at me, but given the location of where I was, it would have been hard to get a clear image of me. He walked across the street to where a school is, then turned around on the other side of the street so he was now facing me, and he just stood there and stared while smoking his cigarette, the light I thought I initially saw. He stood there for a few minutes, and I went in to get my son to come out with me while I finished. He is nineteen. When my son came out, the guy had already walked past then back again and was heading back for a second time. My son stood in the middle of the sidewalk and just kept an eye on him. He passed us and got to the end of the other side of the block. He turned around as if to see if my son was watching him still. He was. He stood to bear staring at us for an eerie length of time. Then B finally walked away. I do some solo rock climbing on Yosemite big walls from time to time. It's not free solo, the ropeless slip and die version, as I'm still roped in and have various safety systems in place, but it's still damned unsettling to be on cliffs alone. Last fall, I soloed a 1,300 feet route on the Washington column called the Prow. It took me three days. The first night was horrific because a severe thunderstorm rolled in. I spent the entire night shivering wide awake, 500 feet off the ground, as the heavens were rent asunder all around my portalage. That was downright terrifying, especially considering that I was a bit of a lightning rod with all of my aluminum equipment. After I descended two days later, some hikers I bumped into mentioned that they had seen lighting strike the top of the Washington column that night. But the most eerie thing I've ever experienced was the whiteout. Between the thunderstorms and pouring rain on the first and second days, the fog would roll in and start to thicken. At its worst, visibility dropped to 15 feet. On the ground, that qualifies as more than creepy. 500 feet up a vertical granite face and totally alone. It is disorienting and nightmarish. I could see 15 feet up left and right before the rest of the granite faded into the fog. But the worst was looking down into a white abyss. Not seeing another human for three days was weird, but not seeing the ground for several hours scared the bloody shit out of me. Your world condenses to a tiny bubble, and there is nothing to orient you in space but gravity. The closest thing I could compare it to is closing your eyes and floating underwater. It's that level of sensory deprivation, but with a horrifying knowledge that you are utterly alone and isolated. I had similarly terrifying experience the previous year on a solo ascent of the West Face route on Yosemite's Leaning Tower. It's a 900 feet route that consistently overhangs 10, 15 degrees. On the second day, I was behind schedule and was finishing the last bit of climbing in the dark. The very last thing I had to do was ascend a fixed rope attached to my camp, about a 100 feet above me. Ascending the rope involves using clamps that cinch on the rope and allow me to pull myself up the rope only without needing to use the rock face itself. However, the rope hung vertically, and with the overhang of the face, I was about 20-25 feet from the cliff. I had my headlamp on and made the mistake of looking down to see. Nothing. Not a damn thing. There was just a black pit below me as I was too high for my headlamp to illuminate the ground. It was like seeing the blackness of space except beneath you and with no stars. Just like the whiteout on the Washington column, not being able to see ground is a really disconcerting and disorienting feeling. I noped the F out of there pretty quickly and spent a fairly pleasant night 50 feet from the summit before descending the next day.
I was in Alaska studying dormant volcanoes as a field geologist, and most of these trips consisted of 30-day solo excursions, with a sample drop-off every week or two, depending on how remote the survey is. I'll never forget on my 26th day, hundreds of miles from any sign of man, and as I descended the mount walking, maybe a mile off was a man. So naturally I gave the universal greeting of holding my whiskey flask into the air as high as I could hoping he would see the sun glimmer coming from it, and indeed he did. My solidarity had probably gotten the best of me considering I hadn't spoken to anyone else for weeks, and I probably shouldn't have approached him but I was so lonely. He raised his rifle as we got closer and made me dump my rucksack before he lowered it. From the contents that poured out, it appeared he was interested in trade. I followed him back to his camp, which later I realized was his home. It was a shanty wooden hut in the middle of the woods. I realized he had been there for years. He had a rain barrel and no electricity, with multiple animal hides drying out in the sun. He descended upon my whiskey stash, and soon I had given him all my salt, pepper, Tabasco, and just about any other flavoring I had brought with me. He was fascinated by a small solar panel I used to charge my GPS and phone. He had been in the wilderness so long that the panel only became commonplace after he went off the grid. He had never heard what 9-11 was. Halfway through our meeting, I realized he had a motive behind speaking to me. He had seen me gathering samples the days before and was worried my company was in the exploration phase of mining. I explained to him that wasn't the case and I was representative from the government. Verifying the volcanoes were classified as dormant correctly. Immediately his demeanor changed and he grabbed his nearest rifle, forcing me to leave, because I said I work with the government. In hindsight, I should have understood a man like this had very little care for government. He walked me a few miles away and told me never to come back and tell my boss the same. I promptly moved on to a new section of my map and marked are the features in the area around his hut as classified correctly. When I was about 12 or 13, my mom, two sisters, Brother and I were driving home from a nearby very small town at about 2 a.m., a commute that we often made to see family who lived there. The drive to and from was only about two to three hours, depending on traffic. However, since it is desert landscape with nothing but flat cracking sand and a few scattered succulent plants, it could often feel much longer. Because it was dark, we didn't even have that to look at. We resorted to playing different road trip games to pass the time. We were all too young at the time to have any entertaining technology, and to keep my mom awake as she had trouble driving at night. After driving for roughly an hour and a half, we crested over a hill where we could see the next larger city in the distance. The city's lights making the overhead clouds glow and the moon sitting low in the horizon to the right, where the clouds tapered off a bit. At this point, we were all completely engulfed in our game until suddenly an insanely bright and basically blanding green flash lit the horizon, looking like it burned hot white towards the middle. When I say green, though, I don't mean a green like normal green. I mean a weird, almost toxic and yellowish-looking color, but still astonishingly bright. It lit the horizon from end to end as far as we could see, and then disappeared as if being sucked away just as swiftly as it appeared, like when someone covers a light source with their hand. At the same time it disappeared, every single light in the city we could see in the distance shut off at once, like a snap of someone's fingers. This scared me because I had seen power outages, and usually they go grid by grid, not all suddenly together. The weirder thing was that the headlights to the car turned off as well, but not the car itself. My mom pretended not to freak out for the sake of us, but as the oldest I could tell, she was genuinely scared. We kept driving for maybe a minute and a half before everything just popped back on again, like someone plugged everything back in. Again, not grid by grid like I'm used to. 
I researched later the next day to see what it could be and saw the green flash phenomenon, but saw that that usually only occurs at sunset. Also tried to see if it could be some sort of power plant thing, but it wasn't that either. Still don't know what it was or what could have caused it, as we were nowhere near a military base or testing ranges of any sort. I used to live in a quiet, remote village nestled among the picturesque landscapes of Sweden, about 40 kilometers northwest of Köping. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other, and life moved at a pace that was more attuned to the rhythm of nature than the hustle and bustle of city life. Our village consisted of no more than ten houses, creating a close-knit community where everyone looked out for one another. One summer day, when I was around eight years old, the sun was shining brightly in the sky, casting a warm glow over the lush countryside. I was out biking with a couple of my adventurous friends, eager to explore the outskirts of our village. Our destination was the old abandoned train station that stood as a relic of times gone by. It had an air of mystery around it, a place where imagination could run wild with tales of the past. As we pedaled closer to the train station, the sense of curiosity mixed with a hint of trepidation. We were about 40 meters away when something caught my attention, a glimpse through a second floor window. There, standing in stark contrast to the surrounding decay and desolation, was a black figure. It felt as if its eyes were piercing through the distance, fixing directly on me. I couldn't help but gasp and point. My voice tinged with a mix of astonishment and unease. Look, do you see that? I asked my friends, my voice quivering slightly. They turned their gazes toward the window, their eyes widening in pure terror. Their silence spoke volumes, and I could tell they had seen it too. The figure stood there, shrouded in darkness, an enigma against the fading light of day. We didn't exchange any words, but the unspoken understanding hung heavily in the air. We needed to get out of there, and fast. Adrenaline surged through our veins as we abandoned our bikes and ran, our hearts pounding in our chests. Fear lent wings to our feet, and we didn't stop until we were back in the heart of the village, panting and trembling. It was a feeling I will never forget, the primal fear that had gripped us, the sensation that we had encountered something beyond our understanding. We gathered in hushed whispers, recounting what we had seen and experienced, our young minds struggling to process the inexplicable. Over the years, the memory of that encounter never faded. Doubts crept in. Had it been a trick of the imagination, a result of our youthful curiosity running wild. But as I grew older, my conviction remained steadfast. To this day, I firmly believe that what I saw in that second floor window was real, a glimpse into a realm beyond our comprehension. Perhaps it was the spirit of a long-lost soul lingering in the shadows of that abandoned train station, or maybe it was something else entirely. Whatever it was, that moment ignited a fascination with the unknown, a curiosity about the mysteries that lie beneath the surface of our world. The small village and that abandoned train station hold a special place in my heart, forever linked to that summer day when innocence collided with the inexplicable. And while time may have passed and life may have taken me on different paths, the memory of that black figure remains etched in my mind, a reminder that the world is full of wonders, some visible, some hidden, and some that only a few are fortunate enough to glimpse. I'm late to the party, but years ago, some friends and I were going to have a campfire at a lake late at night with copious amounts of alcohol. When we got there, we had to drive around a barricade, and one of the cars got stuck in the mud. While trying to get it unstuck, I looked around and made a joke about how we were definitely in the beginning of a horror movie. We all laugh about it. We get the car out and continue to the lake. Get all set up. Fire is going. Music is playing. Drinks are flowing. We're having a great time. 
all of a sudden some random guy comes walking out of the woods with a beer. I get nervous. Everyone else tells me I'm being paranoid since I watch a lot of scary movies. They invite him to join us. He ends up sitting next to me, but a few feet away. I go to grab another beer from the cooler. See the hatchet that someone brought, and I decide I'm going to hold on to it. I sit back down, and this random guy makes some comment about he can see my jugular and wants to bite it. I'm ready to piece TF out, but I, of course, didn't drive. A little while later, he makes a comment about he should have brought his chainsaw. I'm completely alone in thinking this is going to end badly. I move across the fire and closer to the cooler and one of my friends. I set the hatchet next to me, try to ignore the guy and enjoy my night. Fast forward a bit and the guy is making more weird comments so I reach for the hatchet. It's gone. I start glancing around. Discreetly at first, when the guy smiles at me from across the fire and goes looking for this and holds up the hatchet. I said of all of this, I'm leaving and managed to get one of my friends to leave. The next day, everyone said that nothing more happened. But as someone who has seen a lot of movies, I wasn't taking any chances. I am white, but I'm not laugh or a crazy guy with a hatchet white. I called an elk to camp, was camping with my family in our luxury camp kit. I have three types of camp kit. This one has a blow-up mattress. I blow it up with an accordion-style raft pump. This pump makes what's best described as an elk mating bugle. This is no cell service deep in the woods type of camping. It was also rut season. Sitting around the campfire after wife, daughter, and dog went to bed, I heard a large creature about 50 feet from me. Never saw it, but the mass and noise makes me think I called an elk from across the valley. Another story. Wife, sister, and boyfriend flew into town and they wanted to go camping. Was driving down a very rough road quickly. Vehicle is modified and I enjoy off, roading, to an awesome campsite that has a bluff to sunrise and sunset with one road in and out. Again, very deep in the woods. Everyone was falling asleep on the drive, so nobody else saw. Driving down the road, the largest cinnamon bear I've ever seen jumped in front of my forerunner, ran 100 yards, then ducked out. We were maybe a quarter mile from where I planned to camp. Bear was the size of my forerunner from the windshield forward, guessing 1,200 plus pounds. We did not camp where I planned. I'm comfortable with bear while I camp as they are usually six, seven hundred pounds black bear and I have safeguards to fight that off. Not this bear. I could double my mace and guns and still wouldn't mess with that guy. Decided to hike up Matt Warning, Queensland, Australia at about 10 p.m. at night with my girlfriend. We were planning to hike up through the night, which was about three, four hours, camp and smoke weed at the top, and then catch the sunrise. Foolishly, we were hiking with a single torch and an iPhone light, about halfway up and it's pitch black. Really quiet, super creepy. We decide to have a break and take a seat on a log to chill. Out of nowhere, we see a light way below us on the mountainside. It looked like a headlamp. Okay, so maybe some else is hiking up in the middle of the night. Kind of freak, but whatever, we push on. For the next hour or so, I would keep checking behind us and catching this light tracking behind us in and out of the tree line. We finally get to the summit, which turns into a scramble and make it to the top. There's a platform up there, so we set up and relax. I'm kind of sketching out. The weed isn't helping, but looking around expecting someone else to show up but no one came. We unpacked sleeping bags, eat some food, and no off to sleep. I woke up about 4 a.m. as the sky started to brighten up and find backpack gone with all out stuff and sprawled out across the platform. It was dead silent and just super eerie to wake up to. Anyways, we both freaked, grabbed our stuff, and basically ran back down the mountain. 
I swear to you that what I'm about to share is an account of a harrowing experience that truly occurred. As a member of the park ranger team in Yosemite National Park, I never imagined encountering anything beyond the natural wonders of the wilderness. Yet fate had a different plan for us. It was an ordinary day when the call came in about the strange and prolonged solar eclipse casting an eerie darkness over the park. Our leader, John, wasted no time in assembling the team to investigate this perplexing phenomenon. We set out with a mix of curiosity and trepidation, uncertain of what lay ahead. As we journeyed deeper into the heart of Yosemite, the darkness seemed to intensify, enveloping the once vibrant landscape. The forest canopy, once dappled with sunlight, was now a canopy of shadows, it was an unnerving sight, but we pressed on, determined to uncover the source of this unnatural eclipse. It was during this journey that we first caught a glimpse of the unsettling figure lurking amidst the trees. It stood tall and imposing eight to nine feet, or perhaps even taller, casting a long and eerie shadow that seemed to stretch beyond what was physically possible. The figure's eyes were what caught our attention first large and shaped like those we've seen in depictions of aliens. They shone with an otherworldly gleam. They pierced through the darkness, unnerving us to the core. The being itself was a void of blackness, a darkness so profound that it seemed to absorb all light around it. Its cloak, if one could call it that, flowed like liquid shadow, defying the laws of physics. At times it appeared to wear a peculiar, toboggan-like cap, but the darkness melted it seamlessly with its cloak, obscuring its features further. As we approached, we could see that the figure was emaciated and gaunt, with an unsettling air of fragility about it. Yet its eyes held a hint of intelligence and a gleam that suggested something beyond our comprehension. It stood there motionless, with no visible hands or feet, simply staring straight ahead as if locked in a trance. We were baffled and intrigued, our scientific minds yearning to understand this enigmatic presence. Slowly, we attempted to approach the creature, hoping to examine it and record this unparalleled encounter. But it was not as oblivious to us as it appeared. With an unnerving speed and agility, it turned towards us, its large eyes locking onto our team. In that moment, an inexplicable feeling of dread washed over us. It was as if we were intruders in a realm not meant for human eyes. Before we could react, the creature grabbed a hefty rock and hurled it towards us with a force that defied its frail appearance. The rock sailed through the air, barely missing us as we stumbled backward in fear. A shrill and otherworldly screech erupted from the creature's mouth, an unsettling sound that seemed to penetrate our very soul. Before we could gather our wits, the shadow figure vanished into the dense woods, leaving us shaken and unsure of what had just transpired. Fear had gripped our hearts, but an insatiable curiosity gnawed at our minds. As the days wore on, the prolonged solar eclipse persisted, casting an impenetrable darkness over the park. We continued our investigations, but each day the shadows seemed to grow denser and our vision became limited. With the eclipse showing no signs of ending, our sight began to fail us. The darkness enveloped us, and we were left fumbling in a world of shadows. Panic surged through our ranks as we wondered if we would ever escape this endless night. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the solar eclipse ceased. The sun's rays broke through the darkness, blinding us for a moment as we slowly regained our vision. Confusion and relief washed over us as we looked around unsure of what had transpired. The unsettling figure, the creature of darkness, was nowhere to be seen. Had it returned to the shadows from whence it came, or had it vanished to a realm beyond our comprehension? Let me share with you this true story. One day, my family and I were driving down a road bordered by a whole bunch of woods. As we were driving, something caught my eye in a nearby field. 
At first glance, it seemed like a bear, but upon closer inspection, I realized it was not a bear at all. The creature stood tall, about eight to ten feet, according to my dad, with the grass reaching up to its knees. We had a clear view of it for about seven to ten seconds. Startled, I exclaimed, Guys, did you see that? To my surprise, my dad responded, Wait, you saw that too? The creature was covered head to toe in thick four-inch long hair, standing on two legs like a human. After returning home, my dad and I decided to venture back to the same area the following day to investigate further. And believe it or not, we stumbled upon a 17-inch long footprint. Intrigued, we spent 45 minutes exploring the woods, and the area seemed like a suitable habitat for a Bigfoot. That day, I became convinced that what I had witnessed was indeed a Bigfoot. Near Strasburg, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, August 1978, afternoon, three Amish men were working in their field when a strange-looking man approached them from a neighboring farm. The man was yelling, jumping about. The Amish men were alarmed and noticed that this man had arms, legs, and a face that seemed different, more animal than human. He had coarse dark hair on his limbs and face and wore dark and tattered boxer shorts. As the man, creature approached closer, he yelled something, but it was not understood by the men. The men ran towards their house. The man, creature was behind them. One of the Amish men ducked into the dairy barn and the other two immediately entered the house. An elderly Amish woman who had been in the garden came to see what was taking place on. When the man, Creature saw her, it stopped running, sat down on the grass, and stared at the sky. The men came out of the house, and one slowly walked over to the man, Creature, and attempted to talk to it. The man, Creature, continued to look at the sky, but muttered. The man and woman noticed that a horrible stench permeated from this creature described as rotting flesh. After several minutes, the creature got to its feet and walked towards the dairy barn. As it did, witnesses noticed that the creature was fading away. Eventually, it vanished from view just before it reached the barn. Shocked, the Amish witnesses dropped to their knees, not knowing what they had witnessed. At the time this happened, I lived near St. Louis, Missouri, with my daughter and my husband. My daughter, her friend, and I had gone to a local mall to do some shopping before school started. We were walking out of one of the stores, and there were some people walking in at the same time. I happened to glance up and notice one of the women walking in. Her true face had shown through her human skin. It was the face of a brown horse, with the shape of the horse's head morphed under the woman's long, dark hair. When she noticed that I saw her true form, she snapped her head around and stared at me as I walked away. I was telling my daughter and her friend what I saw and what was happening, but they just laughed and did not believe me. Please tell me someone else has seen something like this and I am not the only one. I can't forget what I saw that day. I wish I could draw, but I can't. Please, someone tell me that they are seeing something like this. It was at the Chesterfield Mall in Chesterfield, Missouri in 2012. I have experienced many paranormal encounters in the past, but this one is near the top of the list. The only times I have ever smelled anything were the few times I smelled cinnamon all around me, while no one else did. It happened in my home as well as in bars. And in the car, I have also smelled a strong odor of cigarettes around me. Others could smell it in our home. None of us smoke, and all windows were closed. My son and three other men were over a mile off the main road on the Cape Fear River fishing all afternoon, just before dark. My son wandered into the woods to maybe spot deer feeding in the afternoon. I decided to walk up the two rut, muddy road, thick woods on both sides to the main road because fishing was slow. The guys had a fire right on the river bank, and so I told them I would be back in a while. 
As I was walking along the road, I was hearing lots of scurrying in the woods on both sides. I had no flashlight and thought, man, there are a lot of deer around because this area is known for lots of wildlife. As I made it along, I was unnerved at the sounds in the forest. So I found myself steady looking to maybe see what I thought was deer and maybe it was. The woods were really dark. The road leads to a field which is maybe 200 yards or more wide, just short of the main road as I came up on the hill to the edge of the field. I was shocked to see three large orange balls moving down towards the ground and towards myself, and they stopped just over the trees, maybe a mile away or closer, and hovered there. I knew it was not natural. I am a commercial pilot, and I know aircraft. I stood in shock, thinking this cannot be real. I stayed maybe 10 to 15 minutes, then began to feel nervous, so I made my way back to the man on the river in a hurry mud and all. I then, in a panic, took off looking for my son, which was 17 years old at the time. And as I started into the woods calling him, he came towards me totally shaken, telling me, Dad, you will never believe me, but I have been hiding from aliens. I am scared they are in the woods and I believed at that time he had seen something he was serious. I told him, Junior, I just saw three orange UFOs up at the road, and it scared me, so I came looking for you. We made it back to the river, and my son and excited began to tell the other three men what he had seen, and they started on the both of us. What I did not know was the three of them saw the same thing as my son during that time, the sequence. I am not sure, but we all saw the same. It was a clear, cold night. Stars were bright, and about that time, one of the other men holding a fishing pole hollered, Look, up into all our amazement, the stars looked as if six to eight of them, from different parts of the sky, moved very fast, seeming to converge in a group. And then all of a sudden, three of the objects, side by side, came over our heads and landed or went out of sight on the other side of the river. Maybe two to four hundred yards away, all three lights were round, bright white, blinding lights, as big as maybe 100 yards in diameter, all side by side, all touching down, or going out of sight in the forest, just on the other side of the river. It scared all of us so bad, the three friends of mine, along with my son and me, dropped our fishing poles, screaming, let's go home. We left fire poles, and all speeding up the muddy road to the main road, each one in a panic. Some of the men were fussing. Take me home first. I need to find my wife and children. When we made it to the top of the hill, this is where the trees on both sides end, and the field starts. I slammed on the brakes, all of us, in shock, to see what looked like a brilliant white egg-shaped sphere with a tail with long spikes all around the middle. In front section, hovering 20 feet over the main road, 200 yards from us, and it looked as if it, or the spike part of it, was making slow revolution. This, I tell you, this is true. Four grown men as old as 50, and my 17-year-old son was frozen in my truck, looking at this thing straight in front of us. The lights were brilliant white. The object them appeared to raise up started down the road in the direction that we intended to go, and then it shot off just over the trees out of sight. The three orange balls were no longer there. All five of us were terrified. We raced to Donnie's home first. He ran to the door. His wife came out, and we all told her of the story, and were all looking at the sky. Gene, who was 50 years old, lived next door. We ran him home and then raced to David's home. His wife came out to meet us, and all of us witnessed strange lights over the trees behind his home. My son and I started home to see cars stopped alongside of the road looking at the same lights. We made it home and was terrified trying to calm down. We found ourselves sitting in what we call is the red room, which is my private study off of my bedroom on the rear of the home, staring out the window at the sky. I live on six acres of land, and we have a large dog kennel just in the woods behind my home and a Chesapeake Bay Retriever which lives on my back steps, a guard dog. She lets us know if anything from a person to a squirrel is on our property. We were home maybe four hours, calmed down a lot. 
No TV didn't have one at that time. I guess it was around 1 to 2 a.m., and there was a noise that sounded sort of like a prop jet flew treetop high over the house. I ran outside and could see nothing. Within 30 to 45 minutes, all the dogs in the kennel were roaring. They are all hounds, and they will tell you when there is something there that is not supposed to be. At that time, my retriever was going crazy hair standing up on her back, barking towards the kennel. My son was scared, but I convinced him to go with me to see what had the dog stirred up. My son and I opened the door, and the retriever took off, you see. She most of the time would not leave the patio, unless I go out if she is stirred up. There was frost on the ground, didn't even have shoes on. We took off behind her, and she ran just behind the kennels, and all the dogs were roaring, and she was hair standing up, barking at something in the bushes, along with all the other dogs in the kennel, and then she took off after what ever it was, and so my son and I ran back down the road that leads to the kennel to my backyard, at the very rear of the property trying to cut off whatever it was she was chasing. When I got to the blueberry hedgerow, which at the very rear of the property, she was still the dog making her way to me in a roaring like panic. At that time, I stopped not really scared, but kind of numb to see this max of four tall creature person alien staring at me. It looked as if it had a clear glass-like covering around it. It appeared to have a faint glow of red and black, the face I could not see anything but what looked like it had a red set of goggles and a black or dark covering over the lower part of its face, sort of like a mask. The body appeared to sort of glow. I can probably draw it better than explain it. It then disappeared just as my son and the dog got right up on it, and my son then told me, you see, I am not crazy. This was the same description as he told everyone. I will not go into detail, but my son and I were committed to an insane asylum by our family because they really thought we were crazy. We were released within two days, and then my father came to me and apologized when he said he had heard on the radio and the news that lots of people had been seeing strange lights and that the government reported that a Soviet satellite had fallen that same night. I am 45 years old with four children, churchgoer, retired builder, and commercial pilot. I have been ridiculed, committed along with my son, and oppressed to say anything. But I know what I saw, and four other men will say the same I have been since hooked on UFO files trying to find others that have had the same experience. I will take a lie detector, be hypnotized, whatever, to bring the truth to the public. My son and the other three men all saw the same and have their own accounts. Yesterday, my brother and I set out on a hunting trip, eager to find a fresh location not far from where our father had recently bagged a buck from the road. Armed with our bows, we headed up a logging road beside First Creek. As the late evening approached, hoping to discover the perfect spot for our tree stand. Our search led us to a steep ridge covered in dense pine trees, offering an ideal shady spot where deer could rest during the day. At the ridge's base, a clearing cut through by the road seemed like the perfect spot for moonlit grazing. Excitement surged through us as we realized the potential of the location, and we wasted no time preparing our ambush. But our excitement soon turned to fear as unsettling screams pierced the air. We exchanged fearful glances, desperately trying to figure out the source of the terrifying noise. It was unlike anything we had ever heard before, a chilling blend of a woman's scream with a deeper and louder tone. Anxious and frightened, we slowly backed down the road, our eyes scanning the tree line for any sign of what could be causing such a dreadful commotion. The eerie screams followed us, never drawing closer, yet refusing to fade away. There were no crashing sounds of brush to indicate movement, just the haunting echoes that sent shivers down our spines. As we finally reached the main road and turned back towards our camp, the unnerving screams finally ceased. We rushed back to the campsite, with my younger brother half-jokingly suggesting maybe it was Bigfoot. 
We briefly discussed the strange occurrence around the campfire, but the other hunters seemed hesitant to share much about the banshee, like sounds we had heard leading the topic to be dropped quickly. When asked if we ever thought about what a banshee might look like, my brother and I, being seasoned veterans of the Oregon woods, laughed and admitted we had never really considered it. As for hunting in that direction again, my older brother grinned sheepishly and pointed in the opposite direction of First Creek, saying, Now, nah, we've hunted over that way ever since. I was in the mountains of North Carolina for several days. It was a beautiful and peaceful hiking trip with my brother, sister, and their friend Caleb. Until one early morning around 3 a.m., when every creature in a 10-mile radius was chirping, squeaking, howling, or scampering around through the wood. Being from the Midwest and having survived two tornadoes, I thought the worst weather event of my life was about to occur, and I was sleeping in a hammock. For those who don't know, just before a tornado is formed above your head, every animal in sight will be freaking the fout. They know. They can feel it. You can feel it too. You just won't know what that new feeling is until the 60-year-old tree is beside you or being ripped from the ground. Being in the eye of a tornado is even more strange, as all those same animals in sight are frozen. Sure, they still exist, but their little soul is on hold, and they don't do much more than look around quietly. It's creepy. Anyway, this wasn't a tornado. 3 a.m., the fire we made was just ambers and a roaring thunder of animals freaking out. I peeked my head out, out of my hammock, imagining getting my face smashed in by the first softball-sized hail, with my luck just for looking. But no... There was no bad weather. There was no storm or looming catastrophe. It was a beautiful night, aside from the roaring animal kingdom. My brother peeked his head out of hammock above me and looked down to see if I was awake. When he saw my eyes as wide as saucers, he whispered, What the F is happening? I replied, I don't know, but I wish I was up there in your hammock. Being on the ground level usually is best for guys my size about 235 pounds. I lacked the grace to climb up hammock ropes and jump into bed eight feet off the ground. Anyway, the terrifyingly creepy roaring continued for about 30 seconds, and then it just suddenly stopped. It seemed to be a sweeping effect where the outside of the radius stopped first, and the creatures closer to us stopped last, but it was only a single second or two difference. It was pretty damn synchronized. My brother and I were freaked the F out. After five minutes of silence, we got out of the hammocks and started the fire up again. This time, we made sure it was big enough to light up a hundred feet out. The last thing we need is a Bigfoot or some weird shit going down. My brother went up to the ridge to check on my sister and Caleb about sixty feet uphill from our hammocks. Caleb always wanted to be in the highest possible safe spot so he could watch the sunrise from his hammock. As soon as my brother got to their hammocks, he yelled a shrieking kind of yell for me, the kind I had only heard from him twice before, when his friend got his bike handlebar lodged in his stomach about an inch deep as a kid, and when he split his own head open, I ran up to the ridge with the axe in my right hand, the first aid bag in my left hand, and flashlight in my teeth, expecting the worst. When I arrived to Caleb's bottom bunk, he was in a state of shock. His eyes were wide open. He was shivering and shaking, and he was staring down at the valley. Wouldn't you know? My sister didn't even wake up. Figures low. She had her headphones in all night, listening to her folk music. Apparently, she hates the sound of animals and prefers to have a controlled mental state where nothing can make her paranoid. We woke her up, and she had no idea what the hell was going on. She just stayed in her hammock like, What do you want me to do? We eventually got Caleb down to the fire and wrapped him in some blankets. I gave him a shot of whiskey to sip on, but he mostly just held it and stared into the fire. The whole night was too weird for sleep, but Caleb finally laid down next to the fire and fell asleep around 4.45 a.m. 
The sun came up, and my siblings and I decided to leave the fire and go see the sunrise from the ridge. We all sat in Caleb's hammock, still bewildered. The sun was perfect, and Caleb picked out the best spot you could imagine, as usual. But then my brother spotted something strange. What's that? he said, pointing down the valley, right there on the bank of the river. My sister and I struggled to get his perspective, but then finally noticed a clearing. We decided to go check it out, but one of us had to stay with Caleb. My sister volunteered, as she hates creepy things. She didn't want us to go down, but we insisted. I left her my axe and emergency GPS signal thing. I told her to just scream if she needed us and to not hesitate to use her pepper spray. She just said, stop freaking me out and just go. I'll be here when you get back. So my brother and I hiked down to the river. It took about 20 minutes. When we arrived, we felt very uncomfortable. There were no animals around whatsoever. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. The clearing on the riverbank was about 100 yards upstream. We took to the higher side of the bank to keep our distance. I don't think either of us actually expected anything to go down, but we wanted to remain cautious. When we were about 50 yards away at a slight elevation to the clearing, we pulled out our phones to take pictures. But our phones were dead. Mine is known to die, but I have an external battery pack that attaches to my otter box that I know was fully charged. My brother's phone is always reliable and usually attached to his portable solar panel charger that he keeps on the outside of his pack. His shit was dead, too. Both of us tried to hold our power buttons, not believing they were really dead. But when we realized they were definitely not going to turn on, we both got that paranoid look on our faces. We decided to leave, but not before carefully studying the clearing for a few seconds. It was about 100 feet across in the shape of a triangle. All of the bushes and plants that typically grow alongside the river were all flattened down. Even some mature azalea bushes that typically stand six, eight feet tall were eerily laying flat. It's as if everything in that triangle shape had bent down as close to the ground as it could get. Nothing appeared broken, but rather as if it had grown along the earth instead of growing up toward the sun. It was weird as shit, and only in that triangle area. When we got back to camp, Caleb was awake. My sister had a weird look on her face. Caleb was totally normal. Hey, bro, you all right? My brother asked. Caleb just casually answered, yeah, man, doing well. Missed the sunrise, but I guess I needed the sleep. We just looked at him concerned, like, what the F? He was eating a breakfast bar and heating up coffee over the fire. We sat down across from him and I asked, so, hey, do you remember that shit last night? He looked at me puzzled. My brother added, you know, when all the animals freaked out and we found you. He just looked so confused. My sister said, Caleb, stop playing. He asked, what are you talking about? My brother said, bro, you were messed up last night. Caleb laughed and responded, yeah, I figured I had to be because I never sleep next to the fire all wrapped up in blankets, not after getting that bug in my ear that one time. Low. We continued to ask him questions, but he had no memory whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he had a few too many drinks and slept next to the fire. We told him our story, and each of us agreed, but he had no recollection. We told him about the spot next to the river and how our phones wouldn't turn on. We pulled our phones out to show him, and they were already on. My brother had 67% battery, and mine had 40 one percent. We got the creeps real quick. We decided to pack up camp and get the F away from that spot. But before we did, a final sweep, Caleb asked, have you guys seen my camera? He had a nice Dester Sony with a nice lens. And that shit was gone. The weirdest part is he slept with it in his hammock every single time he goes camping. And we've never seen it, not on his body. He even specifically remembered taking it to bed and tucking it in its bag and putting the lens in its sleeve. It's like a ritual for him. He takes super good care of his belongings. We searched around the ridge and all around the fire and in between the two spots. 
It was nowhere to be found. Caleb even went down the ridge a bit toward the river in case it had fallen out and rolled down the hill. But it was gone. We had to leave, and my siblings and I agreed to pitch in to buy him a new one if he would just get the F out of there with us. About three miles and one hour later, my brothers turned to me on the trail and said, Do you think he tried to take a picture of some shit he wasn't supposed to see? The creepiest feeling swept over me, and I replied, Bro, let's just forget how messed up he was and get the hell away from here. He nodded in agreement. It's been about a year now, and they haven't seen or heard from Caleb in eight months. No one has. The Oregon coastline is as vast as it is beautiful. It's one of those scenes that you need to add the sea smell to truly comprehend it. Me and the missus bought a cabin up here. After a long duration wrestling with lawyers and the local wildlife board, we were finally handed the keys. It was a simple place more designed after what one's idea of a cozy wood cabin would be than an actual economical dwelling place. It even had a moose head mounted above the old log fireplace. It was cheap, unusually cheap, like 30% less than other cabins around the same area. But it was a five-minute walk from the beach, and the views were second to none. My wife and I saved our vacation days and blew the lot on three weeks out here. The first few nights were standard. Board games, roaring fire, and walks in the surrounding forest as well as the beach. The cabin was only about 15 minutes from the nearest town, a forgetful suburb called Coast Town, imaginative, that had all the necessities we could need. Any real estate company will advertise a cabin as remote knowing fine well that a truly isolated home, no matter how fine the interior, wouldn't sell. Luxury can only get the modern man so far, when he has to drive an hour to the nearest door. The illusion of isolation was good enough. My wife planned to meet her parents at the local bar. They spent their retirement money on clunky RV and have been touring the west coast of North America since they collected their last check. Not wanting to hear about the tribal customs of the Canadian British Columbia natives. Again, I said that I'd just kick about the cabin and have some me time. I'd spent the last few holidays with her parents, so I'd put in my family time and she knew that. The only thing more charming than the cabin itself was the yard surrounding the property. The long stretch of robust shrubbery and grassland stretching to a wall of trees that separated pretend countryside from the real deal. The previous owners must have been hunters or wildlife enthusiasts of some kind because the yard was strewn with birdhouses, deer feeders, and their bookshelf was full of fauna guides. I had nothing to do, and nettle fix is boring regardless of location. I'd still rather leaf through the various bear species of Oregon than talk to her parents. Stag, black bears, woodpeckers, blah and blah and blah. Each species had a poorly drawn sketch and the most basic information on the animals possible. Species, mule, deer, chance of seeing, high, feed. Live of local flora, can be feed fruit. Who the hell wrote this? This is the most armature shit ever. I threw the magazine onto the table and made my way to the kitchen. I'd held it off for a while, but finally succumbed to the call of beer. Drinking out of boredom isn't ideal, but it is what it is. I moved to the fridge, reached in, and grabbed the long green bottle balanced on a beer pyramid. I was away to head back to the TV when I noticed them. Initially, I had no idea what I was looking at. Kinda looked like when you point a laser pin at a wall. Two red dots about. I'd say six feet of the ground, just hovering there. I knew kids play out here in the woods, or come out here to get wasted, so assumed that this was them just messing with me. They must have known I was aware of them because when I locked my eyes on their laser pointer, or whatever it was, they both moved in unison. I'm not spending the night being messed about by a bunch of punks. Sliding the door to the wooden patio, I saw the two hovering pieces of red seem to move back. Hey, I called, you mind not F around. 
No movement, rustling, or call back from these guys. The red orbs remained in place. I mean it, guys, if off. <sighs> I'm not usually this brass, but it's pitch black out here and I just want to relax. I rarely get a break from the wife. Okay, if you don't leave, I'm calling the cops and they'll see. Before I could conclude my threat, the red orbs disappeared, then reappeared. Almost like they blink. No, they must be clicking their laser pointers or using their phones, or... Then it hit me. If these were kids shining a light at me, wouldn't I see the reflection of their light against my body or somewhere against the cabin wall? Those weren't lights. I shuffled for my phone, searched through the apps, and found my searchlight. As soon as I shone the light, illuminating a slash of light on the grass in front of me, I then saw the red orbs retreat and heard a body moving through brush. It didn't sound like a group of people, or even two teenagers. It sounded like a single entity shifting its weight backwards. I was so preoccupied with my shouting that I didn't notice the smell. It hit me like a sucker punch as soon as removed the slightest attention away from the orbs. The smell was like rotting meat. It reminded me of my uncle's farm, which had a slaughterhouse down the road. I would cycle past the Cyclopean gray building, and the smell of butchered meat and intestinal gore would almost knock me off my bike. Had this smell always been here? I pinched the collar of my shirt around my nose and continued to shine my phone, light towards the glowing red orbs. Every time I would take a step forward, the orbs would retreat. I moved two steps forward to the steps descending the patio and almost in sync, like we were each conducting a performance. The orbs moved back twice. This time I must have been close enough to hear it. As the orbs shifted backwards, the unmistakable noise of weight pressing down onto foliage could be heard. Something was standing between the trees behind my cabin, staring at me. Those weren't lights. They were a pair of eyes. My body lost all sense of gravity as that realization dawned on me. I was so light it felt like I could just float away at the slightest touch. My mind was screaming at me to run, to move back into the cabin, head for the door, get in the tuck parked in the driveway, and just drive. Don't even head to cost. Town, to the bar where my wife will be pleasantly sipping wine with her parents. Just drive far away. My rational mind was not functioning. I could feel my cognitive ability physically slow down. Like time around me started to bend and wobble. I managed to force my body to take a step backwards, which caused the eyes to move forward. If I took a run for it, would whatever was staring at me make chase? This thing must have been at least seven foot tall at an estimate. A bear would surely have come towards me by now or ran when I was shouting earlier. The eyes came closer. I could hear the impressive weight of the creature come towards the light. Soon whatever was confronting me would be illuminated by my phone light. I wasn't sure I could handle seeing this creature. Seeing its full image before me, knowing that all I knew about what was in this word would crash. To have my notions of what I thought was not possible stare me directly in the eye. My spine practically shot through my back when this beast tossed the first stone. It was a small pebble like those that decorated the nearby beach. I could tell that it didn't throw that pebble hard, but the damage to the wall from the small lob showed just how powerful this entity was. I was on the wooden floor. I had fallen backwards and was now making my way back to the screen doors when my hand slipped on something small and round, causing me to fall onto my stomach. As I came to, I noticed that I was surrounded by apples. Green and red Granny Smith supermarket apples. What the F was this? To my right, beneath the indent that the pebble had made on the wooden wall, was an upturned basket I hadn't noticed. I quickly grabbed my phone, rose to my feet, and quickly shone my phone light towards the trees. Maybe I slipped on the upturned apples and knocked my head. The eyes were waiting, staring. Another pebble landed in front of me. I knew that if I turned and ran, this thing would either leave me alone or charge. I was skeptical at the odds being strictly 50-50. It didn't seem to be trying to hurt me. Maybe this was a communication. I picked up a nearby apple and tossed it towards the trees. 
another pebble my way. So I tossed an apple. Again, another pebble knocked against the wooden railings next to me. Two more apples resulted in two more pebbles. This deep for that went on until most of the fallen fruit was gone. Why did I do this act of exchange? I cannot say. I was so exhausted from fear that I acted without rational mind. Like I was guided to do by something outside myself, the pebble stopped. I took this as a cue to step back. The eyes remained stationary and there was no sound. I took another and two more until my back knocked against the sliding doors. The eyes remained focused. I quickly slid open the sliding door and maneuvered my way backwards inside the cabin. As soon as I was past the dividing line between the complex and the patio, I slammed the door shut. Before I could sprint to my truck, I could hear what sounded like loping footsteps combined with heavy breathing. I couldn't move. My throat shut in fight-or-flight mode seemed to crash like a malfunctioning computer program. Suddenly, I could hear a large commotion through the foliage. The commotion grew smaller and quieter as the elongated seconds passed by. I opened the sliding door slightly and saw nothing. No eyes, no glow. No apples either. The yard was a barren as it was the morning I first set eyes on it. The feeling of safety fell upon me like a fire blanket over a blaze. I crashed on the couch and marveled at the sense of peace that naturally arises when you know that you're no longer in danger. In front of me was the wildlife guide I had discarded before all of this in a small post-it note. The note was from the previous owner. Hey there, sorry for taking so long handing over this place. I can assure you that it was as frustrating for us as it was for you two. Lawyers? There's an orchard two miles from here and we pick apples every summer. Left some for you guys out on the patio. It's not much, but hopefully we can let. Bygones be bygones. Enjoy your new crib. Well, we didn't get any apples, but at least something is enjoying them. I took my phone out to call the missus and ask when she would be home when my eyes were drawn back to the wildlife mag. I had thrown it at an angle and could make out a sketch on the page. Lifting the magazine, Arogan Flora and Fauna, I saw a rough sketch of an enormous man on page. More ape than man, but the stare gave it away. Sasquatch, Yowie, Bigfoot, Wood Ape, chance of sighting, very rare, food, do not feed. Sasquatches will take this as an invitation and will be back. There is a ghost town high up in the Montana mountains not far from Yellowstone. Few people know about it. The only road in and out fell into disrepair long ago. To get there requires an intermediate climbing skill set. It can only be attempted when conditions are warm and dry, which around here amounts to a window of a couple of months each year. My grandfather spoke of it once. The story lacked detail, the particulars lost in the fog of memory, and Pop was never one to embellish once his recollection failed. It was a story he heard as a boy, of a silver mine up in the mountains, of a creature that called the forest home. It was no bear. It was no wolf. Whatever it was refused to share the land with the miners and the fledgling town built to support them. What followed was a massacre. The survivors abandoned the town and never returned. Last summer, Taylor and I hiked and camped for a week within Yellowstone National Park. We lucked out with the weather. We went off grid and loved every minute. The last night, beside a whispering fire, we promised we would do it again. As the firmament above turned about the North Star, I told her about the ghost town. She breathed the Tory in. That's where we would go. A harsh winter is rendered tolerable by the promise of spring. It was the summer, though, that held my attention. A long break from school and a week in the mountains. It is a rare treat to do precisely what you most desire. The warmth of the sun brought with it an unbridled giddiness. The wait was almost over. We drove as far as we could, winding our way up between mountains stripped of the white caps of winter and smeared with green and blue and brown. Taylor rolled the car to a stop on the shoulder of a lonely dirt track. The crisp mountain air tempered the warmth of the sun. 
We shouldered our packs and climbed. What is left of the ghost town, as far as we knew, did not amount to much. The rangers fingered it on a map, though none had been up there. The location was an inherited knowledge. My grandfather could only guess as to the whereabouts. It's up there somewhere, he had said. When I told him our plans and that it was his story that inspired our destination, a smile gave way to pensiveness. He told me to be careful. I told him not to worry. The spruce trees thinned the higher we climbed. We scrambled up a rocky shoulder and Taylor checked the map. We were making good ground. If luck fell on our side, we would get there by sunset. An impassable chunk of vertical rock face led to a detour that cost us a couple of hours. It would have to be tomorrow. We camped in a clearing with a view of our destination across the plain. In the distance, the trees huddled together as if against the cool night air and obscured the X on the map. I wondered what we would find. There was a good chance little remained. Perhaps a few stumps where a rudimentary wooden house once stood. We turned our attention to the sky and watched for shooting stars and agreed it didn't matter. Taylor woke me in the dead of the night. The half moon hung low over the mountains. Her whispered words came out in bursts. My groggy brain took its time assembling them into something coherent. She had heard something. The crack of a tree branch, sharp and loud as if it had been snapped like a twig. And now there was a light in the pale silver glow of the moon. I followed her outstretched hand. Hanging just above the horizon, a yellow light flickered. It gave the impression of a candle burning in a window. Except out here, there were no windows and no one to burn a candle. I could only offer vague solutions. An optical trick played by some atmospheric anomaly. A hunting group around a campfire, though this was not a usual place for such things. Whatever it was, it lay far enough away to pose no danger. What neither of us said is that it lay in the direction of our travel. We lay back down. For a time, I opened my right eye at intervals to check if the light remained. It did, and then I slept. We barely spoke in the morning and set off in the direction of the ghost town. I was anxious to uncover a mundane explanation for the light we saw the night before. The remains of a campfire, or some hermit living alone up in the mountains. The way Taylor kept her eyes on the trees ahead told me she was thinking the same. We entered into the thick patch of forest. The trees grew close and blocked the sun. Stray branches scratched at our bare legs. The ground undulated, and I found myself instinctively following it down, and soon I was disoriented. Taylor took out the map and the GPS. Inexplicably, the GPS gave no signal, and she turned her attention to the map. I ventured forwards until my boots stubbed against something solid. After a glance down, I jumped back. A wooden stake driven into the hard earth. It had cracked about a foot above the ground, and whatever once had been above, I could only guess at, but then more emerged from between the trees. To my left, a clearing full of them. Wooden crosses arranged haphazardly. Dozens of them. I called out to Taylor, my voice thin and small. I stepped through the cemetery, careful not to step on the ground directly in front of any cross. An old superstition, difficult to kick. The crucifixes were rudimentary, simple planks of wood. Some were overtaken by rot, others preserved well enough to read an inscription across the horizontal member. Names and dates. The congregation in the back corner contained no less than six, all with the same date, December 7, 1891. The massacre of my grandfather's story, I thought. Probably cholera, Taylor said, voicing her own explanation. If there is anything left of that town, we must be close. Beyond the cemetery, the spruce thinned and the ground rose. We crested the slope, and there it was. The remains of the town stood on a plateau of hard earth. A few of the wooden houses remained as complete structures. The timber warped and cracked and bleached the color of the ground. A few more were relieved of roofs and parts of walls, leaving a fragile relic of what had been. My eyes swept up the sloping mountain beyond where a rusted red limb of mining equipment poked above the rocks. Taylor approached the closest house and pushed the door. 
The gentle force tore the door from its hinge and it slept against the dirt interior of the house. Needles from the surrounding spruce littered the floor. She ventured inside. I lingered on the outside and examined a pair of grooves in the timber siding. Weather had worn the edges. I ran my fingers down them and wondered what could have made such marks. This is cool, Taylor said. She was right. Some of the houses contained old tables and chairs and bed frames left behind before the move back down the mountain. We found little else save a lone glass bottle half buried in the ground. We dumped our gear beside the house closest to the cemetery and set about scaling the rock in the direction of the mining equipment beyond. We found a crude staircase cut into the rock and powered to the top. What remained of the mining equipment amounted to an uh, off-frame with a bucket on rails to extract the dirt in a few abandoned picks. A shaft cut into the earth and was soon swallowed by darkness. We could only guess at the depth. I scrambled up a slope beyond and sat on a small rock platform with a lookout over the valley below, my legs dangling over the side. In the distance, the mountains looked blue. We lingered there for a time and until the sun kissed the peaks to the west. Tonight, we would camp at the ghost town and we would stay a few days. The first sign of trouble was my red windbreaker lying on the ground beside a half-collapsed house at the back of the ghost town. When we left, the windbreaker was packed tight into my backpack. Something had messed with my bag. It wouldn't be the first time. Squirrels or birds had done it before. But I was sure the windbreaker was deep down in my bag. It would take a persistent squirrel to get to it. A second option had my heart thumping. A bear. Our gear was a mess. Our clothes and sleeping bags were strewn across the ground. The small gas burner was upturned. My backpack had two parallel tiers running top to bottom. I ran my hand over them like I had the two grooves in the siding on the house. This was no squirrel. Taylor picked up her black pan and turned it in her hand. She showed me. One side buckled inwards. Taylor gripped it and pulled at the metal to bring it back into shape. It did not budge. A bear, I said. It had to be. I fumbled in my bag for the canister of bear mace. My muscles tensed and my hands worked frantically until I found it, stored where I had left it. At least we still had that. We searched the ground and looked for bear tracks. The tell-tale wide paws and grouping of front and back legs together. I found a depression in the ground. I hovered my foot above the footprint. My shoe dwarfed in comparison. In no second print, Whatever came into our camp did so on two legs, and at the base of those two legs were extraordinary feet. It can't be true. Someone is messing with us, Taylor inspected the print. Neither of us had ever seen anything like it. I looked west, and the sun was already gone. The sky turning a shade of orange at the horizon. Light would fade fast. We had few options. Whatever it was that had been here was not here now. We had planned to camp outside under the stars, but with something stalking the forest, we rolled our sleeping bags and mats inside one of the houses. At least it provided some semblance of security. We did not risk a fire. Darkness overwhelmed the light quickly and completely. Clouds rolled in from the west at nightfall. A light breeze carried a faint hint of moisture. The forecast had warned of possible storms. I stuck my head out one of the windows, and aside from a blurred smudge of the moon through the clouds, the sky gave no light. We were on edge. Inside the house, it was a deep pitch black. I set the canister of bare mace beside my pillow, periodically palming it to make sure it was still there. Every crack and rustle from the forest had his twitching and turning our ears to the sound. I buried my head between my knees and wondered how I could tolerate the hours left until morning. I apologized to Taylor for suggesting we come out here. She laughed it off. We get through it and have an amazing story to tell. Her voice trembled. I don't know what time I fell asleep. When I woke, it was still dark and my pillow was wet. Light rain made a gentle. Wrapping on the roof. A hole in the roof let through a small drip. I dragged my sleeping bag over to a dry section of floor. In the distance, thunder rumbled, low and ominous. Then something else, closer, 
a crack from the forest. Not a twig, but something more substantial. And then a growl, low and deep. I shook Taylor awake. In the darkness we listened. Nothing. Had I dreamed it? No, I couldn't have. There was something out there. Should we risk turning on the torch? No. We had to be quiet. I closed my hands around the bare mace. The drumming on the roof intensified. The drip drip of the leak in the roof turned to a constant dribble. A flash lit up the sky and on its heels a clap of thunder that shook the flimsy structure we had chosen as our protector. The door flew open. I let out an involuntary scream. In the strengthening wind, the door flapped back and forth, rapping on the wall. I froze in place, fear rendering my muscles useless. Taylor made a rustling beside me, and I guessed she was moving for the door. Another flash of lightning confirmed my guess, the silhouette of Taylor fumbling in the dark for the door. She used the brief moment of light to gather her bearings and grip the door. A second flash followed the first, and through the doorway a figure emerged. Big and black, it was no bear. In the moment of light, it looked stationary, but my imagination soon put it in motion, lumbering for the open door. Shut the door, I yelled. Taylor clapped shut the door in a deep growl mixed with the thunder. Help me, Taylor screamed. Her voice shifted my brain into gear. I jumped up and scrambled forwards and fell into the door. I braced my legs and pressed my shoulder against the old and cracked timber. Did you see it? I asked. Yes. What was that? I don't know. Guilt flooded my brain. It had been my idea to come out here. I had pushed for a second summer in the mountains. Taylor could have joined her college friends in Mexico. This trip had been, at least in part, a sense of duty for her. I thought of the cemetery and the dozens of graves. The six on a single day. The scratch marks on the house made by a powerful hand. The stories were true, at least in the important details. Something lived up here. Something that did not care to share its home with humans. Taylor's voice cut through my thoughts. Should we run? No. Run where? We had to stay together. The creature pushed at the door with such force. I felt about as big and strong as a toddler. We pushed back and the door slammed back into place. The timber pinched at my shoulder. I felt with my hands and found a split in the wood. The door would not hold much longer. Through the torrent of rain, the creature snorted and spat, its hot breath penetrating the crack in the door and blowing over my neck. It pushed a second time, and that was enough. We fell to the ground, fragments of the splintered door clattering to the floor around us. I landed heavy on my right side, the canister of bear mace spilling from my grasp and rolling away into the darkness. I crawled after it, feeling in the dark and expecting at any moment to be lifted in the air by my ankles. Behind me, Taylor screamed. It at her. Finally, the edge of my index finger hit the cold steel of the canister. I fumbled it into my hands and stood. I saw nothing in the darkness. The rain beat on the roof and the wind howled and the creature snarled and in among it all I found no compass. I prepared to fire the mace in random hope and hesitated a second, enough for a jagged fork of lightning to illuminate the sky. The animal held Taylor close to its chest in the corner of the room. I jumped a single step, and as the world went dark again, I sprayed in hope. The creature wailed in pain, and Taylor thudded to the ground at my feet. Heavy footsteps sloshed on the sodden ground outside the house and then stopped. He wasn't gone yet. I stepped out into the rain. The waterlogged ground saturated my woolen socks. The rain fell thick and cold. A freezing wind sucked the warmth from my body. I listened. I waited. I shivered. The first dose may not have sent it fleeing to the forest, but a second might. Where was the lightning? Was the storm spent? A hand gripped my bicep. It pulled me close. Lightning lit up the sky. My face was inches from his. I was eerily human, a thick mat of black hair soaked from the rain. With my free hand, I pushed the canister to his flat nose and sprayed. He threw his hands in the air and lifted me, clean off the ground. For a moment, I felt weightless and then came crashing back down. Soggy footfalls faded into the distance. It was gone. 
We huddled in the back corner of the house until daybreak. With the rising of the sun, the rain turned to drizzle and finally stopped. We kicked at the fragments of the splintered door. Outside, several vague footprints pressed into the mud, partially destroyed by the rain. We gathered our things and began the walk home. The crosses standing in the cemetery hammered home that we had been lucky. Before commencing our descent down the shoulder of rock, I turned and looked back up the slope. In the gloom, a lone light shone on the hill where the ghost town and the cemetery stood. Not a welcome light, but a warning. So me and my friend, I'll name them Red, went down to a bridge that was over a river. The area was pretty shaded and trees was covering the bridge. Red and I were hanging out there and we heard a noise at first. We didn't think anything of it. Then we heard another noise and Red started running. I followed them. While we were running, I heard rustling to my left and something told me to run faster. So when I ran faster, Red looked behind me and they saw a six-fifth guy with no face standing behind me. It was in the shade. He was wearing a white sweater with blue jeans. Anyway, we got to my ATV and we turned around and saw it walking the opposite way. It wasn't walking normal. It was walking like an NPC. It turned the corner on the bridge and disappeared. We got super scared, and I tried to start the AD, but it somehow got stuck in the gravel. It was so stuck we had to have help by a random stranger. We eventually got home, but later we decided to go to a cemetery at night. The cemetery wasn't even a mile away from the bridge. I had another friend come over. I named them Blue, and we drove over to the cemetery. Once we pulled into the cemetery, everything was just gray and the sun had just barely went down. I saw some cloud of smoke right across from me, and I had the urge to go further into the cemetery. All of a sudden, I just pressed the gas, dubbed up my hand, and when I drove past the cemetery, I felt this feeling of determination, and I had this thought that wasn't mine, and it was, I have to save them. And I stopped at a corner, and I looked to my left, and I saw a cloud of dark smoke, and I remember having this thought that wasn't mine, and it was. It's hunting us. After that, my head went back, and my body was shaking and gagging. Then I just suddenly pressed on the gas with my hand, and I flew around the corner. My hand was stuck, and I couldn't move it from the position of being on the gas button. I pulled over and showed my friends my hand. I could barely pull it away, and it was shaking. It hurt a lot. So I said someone take over. I can't drive anymore, and I got up to switch with Red. But my body was thrown down, and then I passed the gas button to drive. Blue was praying while we were at the cemetery, and they got punched in the gut, and they felt like throwing up. So they were leaned over while I was driving home. And Red had a clear shot of me. Mind you, they let go of the IB and pulled their knife out. Eventually, we got home, and Red was acting strange. So we went to my basement, and me and Blue started to sage Red. But they didn't like it. Also, Red was staring at me and smiling the entire time. So I saw them reach into their pocket, and then they stood up. I looked away for a second, and their knife was halfway open, and they were staring at me. So I immediately took their knife away, and I was smoke-cleansing Red and saying, whatever has attached to Red's body will be gone, and I was whispering barley audible words. I opened my eyes and Red started chuckling at me. It didn't sound like their normal laugh, so I got my friend and we put a blessing on her to get that out of her, and we both still feel called to go back to the place. What do we do? A few friends and I went on an overnight hike in the Rockies behind our little town a few years back when I was in HS. Our camping site was pretty far up there, and it was getting dark. The spot we were at was nestled in a grove of trees, secluded from the wind and elements, so we decided to stop there for the night. The four of us built a little fire and ate dinner, then just talked for a few hours. Then all of a sudden, my friend leaps forward and douses the fire, with our emergency water plunging us into complete darkness. 
Needless to say, the rest of us were pretty pissed, as there was no reason for him to do this. He quickly shushes us, and we realize he is absolutely terrified. Like so scared, he couldn't even speak or move. The rest of us manage to get a few word out of him, and he tells us to look up on the ridge we're, we should have been camping at. It was pretty far up, so it was kind of hard to see at first, but that sight will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was a fire, a big one, like a bonfire sort of thing. Around the fire were several figures moving in a slow circle. They were humanoid, but not quite. In the end, they had arms and legs like people, but something just seemed different about them that I can't really explain. Almost like the limbs were too long and skinny or something, but maybe not. Anyway, these figures just moved around the fire in a really slow circle, over and over again. My one friend claims he could hear them singing something, but I don't remember anything. Importantly, there was one standing off to the side, a little ways leaning with his arm on a tree branch above his head. It really creeped us out, but we were able to sleep it off. We figured it was a scout troop having a camp or something. Morning came and we finished off our hike to the peak, and on our way down, we passed the place we saw the figures and decided to check out the camp. It was completely deserted. It was obvious that there had been a fire and there were footprints everywhere. Inside the fire pit was a small mound of charred animal bones, probably chipmunk, and a pile of four or five rodent skulls that had been burned. Creepy right. Then we look over at where the one figure was standing. Blood. Not a lot, but enough to be of concern, or anything but enough to be creepy. Then we see the tree branch he was casually leaning against. It was well over any of our heads, and I'm over six foot. That would mean that in order for the figure to lean against it like he was, he would need to be at least seven feet tall. Needless to say, we got off that mountain very fast, and I have never been up there again. We called the fish and wildlife rangers and told them what we saw. They said it was probably just a bunch of kids messing around and not to worry about it. It might have been just that, and we let our imaginations run wild. But all four of us swear to this day we all saw the same thing, and it didn't look like a bunch of kids in the dark. I don't believe in ghosts to the supernatural, but those mountains still scare the shit out of me, and I will never go back there again. It was a chilly morning as my dad and I set out for our elk hunting expedition in the rugged wilderness of northern New Mexico. The forest was dense and overgrown, with old logging trails winding through the trees. We were in the middle of the day, still hunting with our eyes peeled for any signs of elusive prey. As I walked along the trail, I caught a glimpse of something unusual through a small window in the trees and brush. About 100 yards away, there it was, a blue day pack like one of those Jansport backpacks, lying on a fallen tree. The sight was perplexing, as it could only be seen from the exact spot I happened to be standing. I motioned my dad over to confirm what I was seeing. To ensure I wasn't just imagining things, I quickly marked the spot where I saw the pack with two crossed sticks and a branch pointing towards it. My dad arrived at my side and squinted through the foliage, verifying the mysterious blue pack's presence. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to investigate further. My dad would make his way over to the fallen tree while I stayed put, ready to guide him if needed. He navigated through the thick brush and deadfall, carefully making his way to the location I had marked. As he reached the spot where the day pack should have been, he found nothing. The pack had vanished into thin air. But something weird happened. Behind him there was a creature. It was over eight foot tall, brown, hairy, and muscular. I'm skeptic when it comes to Sasquatch existence, but this one was real. Perplexed, I gestured towards him and yelled, Behind you! He didn't hurt me! Scared! I ran towards him, but when I arrived, it vanished. My dad asked me what happened. Why am I scared? And I wanted to tell him, but of fear that he'd not believe me, I kept silent. Why, 
So this happened last year, but I didn't have read it at the time, so I figured I'd share it now. I'm confident it was a Bigfoot, but I could be wrong. So I live surrounded by the woods. We only have a few neighbors here and there. Me, my cousin, and my nephew were outside, and then they went in, so I was outside alone. I was releasing a snail we found. I released the snail, then heard my dog barking, so I looked up. There it was. By our tree line stood a figure. I don't know exactly how tall it was, but I'd say if not six feet, almost six feet tall, it didn't really have the shape of a human. We have hardly any bears in my area. And if it was possibly a bear, our dogs would be going crazy barking. But with this, they ran from whatever it was. I looked away, looked back, and the figure was gone. I quickly went inside because I was freaked out. Also a bit excited because I've always loved cryptids and Bigfoot, so the fact that I possibly saw one made me excited. But that night, my brother and his two friends decided to play hide and seek in the woods. It was at around 1 a.m. I know it's weird to be playing hide and seek that late, especially in the woods, but they did it anyway. Anyways, the next morning they said they swore they saw a figure run past them in the woods. Could it be Bigfoot? I live with my family, but our house is in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods. During hot summer nights, we sleep with the windows open, just the bug screen between us and the great outdoors. Deer and elk sometimes bed down right outside the bedroom window because predators will not come that close to the house. We are used to hearing elk snores. Yes, they do snore, and deer wheezes in the middle of the night. This one dark summer night, though. We were woken up by something that sounded like a gibbering, demented child. It paced around the house, and we could hear the dry grass crunching right outside the window. The thing moved on after a while, but the weird semi-human noises it made were unsettling, to say the least. I saw a thunderbird when I was a kid. So I spent a lot of time, Star, gazing as a kid one summer. My stepdad bought me a really nice telescope with a camera objective to look at the moon and stars with. One night we went out to the hydroelectric dam 40 miles from the nearest town to get some telescopic pictures of the Milky Way. The moon was out in about half illumination without a cloud in the night sky. We were out there until 1 a.m., and we were packing up the telescope and other gear when something with a simply enormous wingspan sped silently over our heads very quickly. It was pitch black with yellow wings and cast a shadow on the ground from the moonlight. It was gone in almost an instant. We looked at each other and both exclaimed in harmony, What in the F was that? I have never heard of any kind of aircraft with a wingspan that large or even one that could move in such complete silence. Even gliders make some kind of wind noise. We were far enough away from any airport or military base for anything to be flying that low. It was like something not of this world. It creeps me out to this day, some twenty years later. When I was 10 or 11, I was sitting at the top of a berm alone overlooking a beautiful valley. I must have sat there for a few minutes in the tall grass, soaking it up. I panned my head to the left slowly and roughly 75 meters away. I could see the ears, eyes, and snout of a dogman sitting in the grass, looking right back at me. I darted back to safety as fast as I could. But when I got there, I realized that the cougar didn't give chase. It must have just been soaking up the scenery as well. I was working in the Magnetti Morelli facility in Pulaski, Tennessee, late evening. The date was January 16, 2016. I walked to the restroom near my work area. Upon entering the employee entrance... Make a left turn in the first hallway, go through the next set of double doors, and turn right until you see a heavy steel door. 
I walked to the restroom and no one was there. In preparation for going back to the floor, I was washing my hands. That's when I felt someone watching me. I turned to look at a shiny silver baseball cap that was flat on top. I thought it was a ghost trying to see me and jumping back quickly with the tip of the brim exposed. My eyes caught sight of a man wearing a silver suit jacket, trousers, gloves, and low-top converse, like shoes made of light gray silver shades. His eyes did not blink. He quickly turned his face in the corner of the bulkhead and was afraid, quivering as I looked at him four feet away. I said, I didn't mean to frighten you, but... I'm about to leave, and it's all right. I'm shy, too. I'm about to be done, so I can get out of your way. I walked back to wash my hands, so he peeked. I thought he must really be ridiculed and humiliated by some of the other employees. But why is he working here, if so? I have never seen him on this shift, and didn't hear the big heavy steel door open with the machine's noise. He was not there when I walked in. He was not a ghost and intelligently moved. He made scuff sounds with his clothing touching the wall and was a solid flesh being. Then I said, I'm leaving now so the restroom is all yours. At a distance of about 11 feet, I walk toward the bulkhead to start my way out. Then another employee opens the heavy steel door and the human-like entity darts from behind the wall and slides for a split second. He looks at me up and down and at my face nervously as if to say you are not supposed to see me. He had long pointed ears and a thin bony pushed up nose and no hair around the cap edges. There was no emblem on any clothing. He quickly swung his head around to see if the employee had seen him yet. I saw a portal opening as he took those few steps between the urinal and the first toilet wall. He ducks his head slightly and leaps in to disappear. There's no way I can take this truth and the unknown to my grave. On a trail in the Angeles National Forest with a friend about a mile in, we hadn't seen anyone else since we entered. While rounding what we thought would be a secluded corner, my friend pulled out a joint and went to light up. The noise of the lighter sparking caused something up the trail to turn around quickly. I couldn't tell what it was right away because the lighting was dappled from trees above and it was colored the same as the trail and rock. I grabbed my friend's arm and quietly said, Stop, stand up, don't turn around, walk backwards slowly. About thirty feet in front of us was a cougar, easily bigger than any dog I've ever seen, save a Great Dane or Bernese but the musculature on it was otherworldly compared to any dog. It wasn't crouched like it was going to come for us. It was turned halfway, with its back arched, the way a house cat sizes up another house cat before they fight. We backed up staring at the thing for what felt like forever, but was only probably three, four seconds before it realized we weren't coming towards it anymore and turned tail. It bounded up what I thought was a sheer 20-foot cliff with such ease it made my mind truly spin at the power of nature and thankful I wasn't asked to test it. We speed, walked back to the trailhead with our heads on such a swivel. They rightly should have popped off. I was in Fort Lewis, Washington during officer candidate school. After a long day of patrols in the pines, my platoon had set up a cigar-shaped outpost and hunkered down for the night. I had second watch with my buddy Brian from Texas. We had set up a defensive position about 10 meters of the tip of the outpost and set up our M60. Our position was hunkered on the edge of this timber line that overlooked a meadow that was about 1,000 men. Wide by 200 M or so deep, the meadow then was bordered by another thick line of timber. Now I must preface. We were in training and going to perform a raid on a simulated enemy village the next day. Our weapons were loaded with blanks and we all had blank firing adapters on the muzzles. How the training worked is there were volunteers from other local army units who would play OPFOR and react to your presence accordingly with simulated gunfights, ambushes, reactions to contact indirect fire, etc. 
Bran and I were fully expecting to get attacked that night by the opera. This was a common tactic to hit when trainees were tired and visibility was poor. However, that night was a full moon and Bran and I had snuck ground coffee into our pockets for later consumption. Our meadow was lit up by the glow of the moon. We had perfect visibility of the entire field of fire. Our defensive position was seemingly impregnable. We had overwatch. We had cover and concealment, and most importantly, we were wide awake. We were ready for anything the OPFOR threw at us. At about one in the morning, a low fog rolled in blanketing the meadow. The crisp night air punctuated the clarity of the moonlight. Brian and I were watching the meadow when he tapped my shoulder. He whispered in my ear, Do you see that? He pointed his finger up to the opposing tree line, where we could see slight movement along the line. I squinted my eyes and could make out shadowy figures slowly advancing towards our position. Brian pushed the safety off the M60, and I hunkered down behind my rifle to get a better look. We counted five, no, three. No, maybe just four figures seemingly gliding out of the timber and onto the meadow. They were hunched over and slowly creeping towards us. The shadows of the trees still obscured the details of the figures. We were sure the OPFOR were conducting a raid on us, and they wanted to maybe take it easy on us, but to cross an open field was ludicrous and poor form. It was just too easy. Didn't these soldiers know they were about to be illuminated perfectly by the light of the full moon, and then would be easy targets for two OKACS candidates? We watched the figures get closer to the light. Only maybe fifty more meters till the shadows ended, and we would have positive target ID and would engage. Brian whispered over to me, Where are their weapons? Brian was right. They appeared to be unarmed. Well, wait. Where are they? They've got something in their hands. Is that a stick? I hissed back. We waited to see what these OPFOR had. The OPFOR finally crossed the shadows and entered the lit-up meadow, less than 100 M from our position, according to our sector sketch. The figures appeared in full visibility of us. My eyes grew big as I realized what I was seeing. The figures were dressed in dusky brown loose-fitting outfits and had what appeared to be small spears and axes. What was most unnerving was their faces were painted bright red and white, which glowed almost fluorescently under the full moon. I sucked in air, Brian screamed contact, and leapt loose with a pig. The machine gun fire ripped through the calm of the still night air, the muzzle flash blinding us both. I lined up my sights on my rifle and fired several shots in succession of the Miss Sixty. After about twenty seconds or so, we quit firing and surveyed the area. The meadow was empty. The figures were gone. Nowhere to be seen. Brian and I were both shaking. We looked around. No enemy soldiers to be seen, and perhaps even more strange, none of our platoon. Or the cadre had woken from the cacophony of gunfire. Brian and I hunkered down closer and waited for the inevitable second wave. The fog rolled out. What was that? I hissed. I don't know, Brian said. We waited for them to come back. They never did. Our watch ended after another hour of being frozen to our guns. Eyes peeled on the meadow. We tried to sleep unsuccessfully. The next morning we asked if anyone heard any gunfire or commotion the night before. No one heard a thing. I was on my way home from Chester, West Virginia, with my girlfriend. We were on RT-68 between East Liverpool, Ohio and Midland, Pennsylvania, along the Ohio River. It was in December 2010. The time was around 3 a.m., and a thing that looked like a black angel flew in front of my truck. It was about six feet tall and was so close we both ducked. Whatever it was came from the riverside of the road. I wanted to go to the Midland Police. But my girlfriend said they would think we were crazy. We often talk about this, but that was as far as it went. One time when I was heading from Chicago to St. Louis on I-55, I had to pee really bad. 
Now I do this trip a lot, so I have a routine route. But this time I was traveling late at night into the early morning, so I stopped at a rest stop to pee, which is something I never do. It was a smaller one with a little playground next to the bathrooms and vending machines. As I walked up to the bathroom, a lady was sitting at a table smoking a cigarette in very trashy clothing and gave me a hey, honey. I ignored her, went to the bathroom, and then headed back to my car. On the way out, the same lady was sitting at the same table except this time with a six, seven-year-old girl who was dressed how a six- or seven-year-old girl should dress. I put my head down and immediately called the police. Just completely creeped me out that I was most likely feet away from a child s trafficking operation. I remember one time my aunt told me this freaky story. My aunt and her friends were coming back from the club late at night, and the club was located about an hour drive from home. As they were driving back on the highway, they noticed a girl that was walking alongside the road. Concerned, they pulled over a couple feet in front of her, and my aunt got out to go talk to the girl to see where she's heading. But when she got out, the girl was gone. There was nowhere she could have gone since the road is surrounded by murky water on both sides. Confused and frightened, she quickly got back in the car and told them to drive. I remember the day when I was returning home from my sister's funeral, feeling utterly exhausted. As I drove, I started noticing shadows and strange movements on the road ahead, which made me feel uneasy. Deciding to take a break, I stopped at a nearby rest area. I turned off the car's engine and lay back, hoping to get some rest. The next thing I knew, I was looking down at myself inside the car. My head was back, eyes shut, and mouth wide open. To my shock, there was some kind of craft next to the car, and I saw beings holding something that emitted a beam of white light directed into my mouth. They seemed to be communicating with each other, saying things like that she had many lessons to learn. I couldn't comprehend what was happening. The being spoke about how I needed to experience cancer, as if it was part of some important process of learning and growth. They kept repeating phrases about the significance of these lessons I had to go through. In the midst of this bizarre encounter, I found myself conversing with a being that had soft, tanned skin. The beings were humanoid in appearance, with large eyes, but no hair. The next thing I knew, I was back in the car, and I continued my drive home, arriving at 3 a.m. The experience left me feeling shaken and confused. In the following days, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something unusual had occurred during that time. Unfortunately, in the future, my fears came true as I was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent an operation. The memory of the encounter with those enigmatic beings haunted me during my recovery. While I managed to overcome the ordeal, the experience remains a mystery to this day leaving me wondering about the true nature of those beings and the lessons they spoke of. On August 14, 1986, I went for a morning walk at Cape Blanco Beach, like any other day. The cool ocean breeze brushed through my hair as I enjoyed the peacefulness of the early hours. Little did I know that this simple stroll would lead to a life-changing encounter. Approaching the north end of the beach, something unusual caught my eye. Two large sets of side by side tracks in the soft sand. They were massive, at least 18 inches long, unlike anything I had ever seen before. Excitement and curiosity rushed through me as I wondered if these could be the legendary Bigfoot tracks. Determined to uncover the truth, I followed the tracks as they led away from the shore and into the dense forest bordering the beach. The tall trees cast shadows and the rustling of leaves beneath my feet was the only sound. The fresh tracks confirmed I was on the trail of something extraordinary. 
Walking for two miles, my heart pounded with anticipation. The forest seemed to engulf me, creating an atmosphere of suspense and wonder. Despite the excitement, I couldn't shake a sense of unease, feeling like an intruder in this mysterious realm. Suddenly, the tracks vanished. There were no signs of where the creature might have gone. Disappointed yet determined, I searched the surrounding area for more clues, but found nothing. It was as if the creature had disappeared into thin air. Feeling watched, I continued my search. Driven by the desire to unravel the secrets hidden within the woods, hours passed, and with the sun climbing higher in the sky, I reluctantly decided to turn back. Although I didn't find concrete evidence of Bigfoot's existence, the encounter left an indelible mark on my soul. This occurred in Oakland, California in November 2016, where my wife's parents live. There had been several shootings in the area, more than normal, and the funeral home on International Bus had been getting a lot of business. My in-laws were driving through Oakland at around 2 a.m. in the morning. My mother-in-law worked as a live and hospice nurse and only had a day or so off. She was coming back at 2 a.m. after having the evening off. While they were driving to her job, they saw a beautiful young woman standing on the corner next to the funeral home who was very well dressed. They saw her at the corner while they were stopped at the intersection and noticed that the woman smiled and then waved at them. They also noticed that her eyes were totally black. My in-laws were frightened and drove away as fast as they could. My father-in-law drops off my mother-in-law at her work and wonders if that ghost woman he saw at the corner will be there on the way back. He had to go through that same intersection. On his way back, she was still there at the corner. This time, he was stuck at the light at the intersection. She again waved to him, and he noticed again she had black eyes. It seemed like she was trying to get him to come over and pick her up. Naturally, when the light turned green, he sped out of that intersection to get home. No one seems to know who she is, but they all seem to agree that her funeral was probably through the funeral home there on that street. As to why she was on that street between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., I think she was looking for victims. My older brother Mark disappeared when I was just seven. The last memory I have of him comes from a lazy Saturday afternoon in the summer of 2008. He was on our backyard porch with a bunch of his high school friends, eating ice cream cones and arguing about horror movies or something. I, I don't know. I never paid much attention to their conversations, but I do remember they were excited about going to their first real party later that night. I came outside to give Mark a gift, a charm bracelet I'd made for him from a series of strung, together Lego blocks. For good luck, I told him. Mark looked at the bracelet. I'd scrawled letters on it in Sharpie, one letter per block. Together, they spelled out Mookie, my nickname for him since I was a toddler. Mark just laughed and pocketed the bracelet. Thanks, Smelly. Ellie, he said, tousling my curly hair. I remember yelling at him and growing red-faced. Then I ran back inside. Don't call me that, I yelled. Those were the last words I said to my brother. Mark and his friends were headed to the Swamp Soiree that night, a tradition at Bartram Forest High School. Each year, a group of popular seniors would throw a big end of the summer bash on the outskirts of the Okegobe Swamp, a massive wilderness area in North Florida about an hour from our home in suburban Jacksonville. The soiree was basically a big kegger with a bonfire where everyone got drunk, smoked pot, and hooked up in their cars, or if they were really wasted in the mud... The area was remote enough that no police ever came by, and there were no locals to piss off. The party's exact location was kept secret, shared only to those fortunate enough to be invited. Swamp soirees were known for their lethal amounts of alcohol and drugs. The kids who threw them always came from wealthy families. They brought multiple kegs of Blue Moon or Stella, handles of top-shelf liquor, 
bags of dank-ass weed, and occasionally cocaine. Mark and his friends arrived early that night, before most others had shown up. According to his friends, some douchy baseball players pressured him into doing a 20-second keg stand. Shortly afterwards, Mark told his friends he was going to take a piss. He looked pale and sweaty, like he was going to throw up, his friend Eric told me years later. The last time anyone saw him, Mark was stumbling around in the darkened woods, headed deeper into the Oki Wee Swamp. Two hours later, his friends drunkenly searched the same wilderness, calling out his name while sinking halfway into the mud. Two days later, my parents searched the area with local law enforcement. Two weeks later, a 400-person search and rescue operation combed the Okigabi Swamp, equipped with helicopters, John boats, and multiple foot teams. And two years later, the final official search ended this time with cadaver dogs. No one ever found anything. It was like Mark had vanished from existence entirely. One moment, there was a smart, sci-fi-obsessed teenager who wanted to design robots that explored distant planets, get married, and raise three, five kids while living in Miami. And the next moment, nothing. I never participated in an official search for my brother. I was too young. But years later, when I was in college at Florida State, I applied for a summer internship at the Okigo Bee National Park in part to look for anything that might have been missed. I'd always been interested in the wilderness, even though my parents never let me go camping or hiking after what happened. They wouldn't even let me play in the woods of our backyard. But that only made me long for such places even more. Mark loved being outdoors. Being in the wild was one of the only ways to keep his spirit alive. One of my earliest memories was of us hiking together on the trails at Guana River State Park. We'd run out ahead of our parents till it was just us in a wide green world full of sprawling oaks, wide marshes, and endless mystery. As kids, we fantasized about running away to live in the woods like a modern-day version of Swiss Family Robinson. We'd never have to go to school. We could stay up as late as we wanted. It would be total freedom. When I went in for my interview at the Okiga Bee Park headquarters, the head interp ranger, George Craig, saw my last name and raised his eyebrows. Ellie Brooks. I'm the little sister of Mark Brooks, I said, answering the question that was forming in his bald head. I helped lead the first search party for him, he explained. Really sad. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thanks, I told him I was using the internship as a way of coping with his loss. He hired me on the spot. The job was simple enough. Most of it consisted of manning the park museum or gift shop and talking to visitors. They would come in to browse the dioramas on swamp wildlife or peruse books on bird watching. The park received visitors from all over the country, but most were locals from the nearby town of Oconee, Pop. 604. They were usually older folks who were retired, stopping by day after day just to talk. These locals had all sorts of crazy stories about the Oki Gobi Swamp. It turned out Oconee was known for two things. Its massive paper mill, which gives the area a noxious fart smell when the wind blows north to south, and its town mascot, the infamous Swamp Wreck. Oconee sits along the eastern edge of the Okigobi Swamp. It's the only human civilization within 50 miles of the wilderness. As such, the town has experienced many unusual animal encounters over the years. Everyone who's ever owned a swimming pool there found a full-grown alligator floating in it at least once. Water moccasins sometimes coiled up on the town's roads to catch warmth in the winter. And locals love to say how the deer population vastly outnumbered the human one. But not all creatures could be explained. Since as far back as 1889, people in the area talked of an eight-foot-tall humanoid alligator that roamed the swamp at night, killing anyone who littered, polluted, or otherwise disrespected the natural ecosystem. They called it the Swamp Wreck. Most reports stated the creature had glowing green eyes, a long, powerful tail that could break bone, and an elongated head full of spear-like crocodilian teeth. 
The swamp rex would hunt at night, then return to its mud hole somewhere deep inside the swamp where no one feared to tread. I first learned of the swamp rex from my older brother. As a child, Mark was fascinated with cryptozoology, the study of unverified creatures like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. He used to tell me campfire stories about the rex when we were little, how it was millions of years old and would travel throughout the swamp by a series of underwater caves. The stories scared the bejesus out of me, but I loved every second of them. He told me once that he wanted to go on an expedition into the heart of the Okigobi to find the creature. I was the only other person who wanted to go with him. It sounded like the perfect adventure, like something out of my favorite movie, Jurassic Park. Mark and I never went on that expedition. He lost interest in stupid fake monsters by the time he was a senior in high school. I doubt the Rex was even on his mind when he attended the Swamp Soiree that fateful night. Mark never saw the Swamp Rex, but many others have claimed to have seen it over the years. Even though the legend dated back to newspaper articles in the late 1800s, it didn't really become known until March 1989, when Oconee Sugarcane Farmer Bill Howard noticed a tall man wandering the edge of his property late one autumn evening. Howard lived on a remote farm on the outskirts of town right next to the Okigobi Swamp. If it was a man, he'd have to walk miles through mighty thick woods to get to my backyard, Howard told reporters. Keeping his eyes on the figure, the farmer grabbed his 12-gauge shotgun and a camcorder he'd recently got for Christmas. I knew right away something wasn't right about it. It stood like a man, but it had this big tail and it moved with a kinda animal grace, he said. Instead of aiming his gun, Howard raised his camcorder and shot the first known footage of the swamp wrecks. The creature only appeared for five seconds on screen before fleeing deeper into the woods. It was somewhat hard to make out, given the footage was shot from a hundred yards away and during twilight. But even with a low-resolution 1980s era camera, people could see the figure had a tail and an elongated head just like the Swamp Rex stories of old. Soon afterwards, Bill Howard's footage aired on the local news and gradually spread throughout the country via cryptozoological outlets like the Weekly World News and nascent Internet forums on the paranormal. Eventually, the creature made its way into greater pop culture. In the 1990s, The X-Files aired a Monster of the Week episode loosely based on the Rex, and the History Channel did a special on it for its Monster Quest series in 2009. Over time, tourists started showing up in Oconee, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature themselves. Various gift shops opened, selling all kinds of Swamp Rex merchandise, from t-shirts to mugs to alligator hats, even Swamp Rex iPub beer. People came from all over the country. Most were skeptics just looking for another wacky Florida story to tell. But some were true believers. Many even believed the Rex was involved in real-life disappearances tied to the Okigobi area. Since 1980, over 50 people have gone missing in or around the swamp, including my older brother. The most famous case happened in the early 1990s when a wealthy land developer named Jerry Flagler vanished after witnesses last saw him in the Okie area with some business partners. He was going to illegally cut down them trees, Oconee's town historian Mary Madrigal told reporters. But the Rex took him before he could. Like Mark, the authorities never found Flagler's body. By 2019, when I was working at the Okigobi National Park, the Swamp Rex had become a vital part of Oconee lore. A cartoon version of it was even featured on the town sign. Though they didn't know my relation, many of the locals who visited the park would tell me stories about what really happened to Mark Brooks. Most of them believed the Swamp Rex took my brother because he was disrespecting the land by being at the Swamp Soiree. How come it didn't take anyone else then? I would ask innocently. There were at least a hundred other kids at the party on the night of Mark's disappearance. The locals usually didn't have an answer to that question, or they'd make up some bullshit excuse like, well, maybe he was the only one littering. 
the only drunken high school student who littered? Sure. My brother was officially pronounced dead on January 12, 2012. His cause of death was listed as probable drowning, the only theory which seemed reasonable. The area where Mark was last seen had a lot of deep pools of water connected to the Oconee River. Given his level of inebriation at the time, it was easy to assume he'd simply fallen into one such pool. Mark never learned how to swim, and then his body was later washed out to sea via the river, which runs from the Okigee Swamp to the Gulf of Mexico. Even though I didn't believe the Swamp Rex theory, like Mark before me, I'd come to a realization that the monsters were always a hoax, or a case of mistaken identity. I still couldn't quite live with the drowning explanation. I needed something more. Another part of my job was something called roving, where I walked the trails and boardwalks of the Okigo Bee National Park, talking to visitors and looking for anything suspect. I did this a few times a week. I didn't carry a firearm. That was for law enforcement, L.E. Rangers only, not in terp ones and definitely not someone doing a college internship. But I did have a high-powered radio that could contact an L.A. in case of emergencies. And I always wore a flat hat, something you've probably seen from many Smokey the Bear ads, so hikers could spot me a mile away. Sometimes they asked about wildlife and the history of the swamp. Most of the time they came to complain about the lack of certain facilities, like trash cans. I roved the wilderness of the Okigobee Swamp for one reason. I was determined to find something, anything, any remnant of my brother's existence. Even if it was just the stupid charm bracelet, I'd given him the day he disappeared. I knew all the search parties before me had covered the same ground, but there were still plenty of stories of someone finding clues in the exact same location people had searched years earlier. It was possible. It had to be possible. A few months into my job, I was roving the north boardwalk when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A flash of movement. It looked like a lanky teenager. The figure dashed into the surrounding cypress trees, disappearing in an area that was usually flooded. I half expected the runaway to sink waist-deep in mud, but this was late March, and it hadn't rained in a month. The land was as dry as it would get, and the mysterious individual had moved expertly through it. I reached for my radio, planning to call in the incident. Someone's gone off the designated trail, I would have said. In most situations, this is something an lay ranger would handle. But something made me put the radio down. A lingering feeling. That kid, was it a boy? He almost looked. Mark. I should have taken it as a warning sign. I wish I'd just radioed the L.E. ranger. Instead, I stepped off the boardwalk and started into the woods. There was nothing in the area where the figure was headed. My peace map just showed a blank spot on the northern edge of the swamp. Because of its extreme density and uninhabitable terrain, almost half of the Okigobi is uncharted. Most of its land is hidden beneath four feet of murky brown water and another five feet of black muck, too difficult to walk through for a detailed survey. I looked for the kid in the cypress trees ahead, but couldn't see any movement. I did see the occasional shoe print in the mud, however. It looked like a converse shoe. Definitely not something you'd want in such terrain. The intermittent tracks led deeper and deeper into the swamp. I came across one every ten to twenty yards. At one point, I stopped to take a drink from my Nalgene bottle and was shocked to see a full two hours had passed. It was almost 5 p.m. Shit. I was supposed to be back at the park headquarters to start closing procedures 30 minutes ago. How was it already five? It felt like I'd stepped off the boardwalk only moments before. I started to backtrack. I planned to let an L.E. know about the lost kid, but first, I needed an excuse for being so late. Was I helping a lost hiker find his way back to the trailhead? Did I have to clean up a bunch of trash on the boardwalk? I was about to radio headquarters when I felt my boots slip out from under me and I tumbled down a small muddy hill, my body crashing through a dense thicket of palmetto bushes. Dazed, I struggled to my feet, 
wiping off as much dirt as I could. My green slacks and gray collared shirt had turned black from muck. My flat hat was crushed. My radio was cracked and unusable, and my cell phone was caked in mud. But as soon as I saw my surroundings, I forgot about everything else. I was inside a campsite, almost an acre in size. The place was astonishing. It had an old canvas tent pitched beneath a sprawling live oak, a fire pit, a small garden, a compost station, a dugout latrine, even a plastic tarp for catching rainwater. A series of large ceramic jars stood by the rain catcher. They looked to be storing water. There was no one around. The tent was empty, but I could tell the site was still inhabited. Everything was well maintained, and the fire pit had some recently burned coals in its center. Who could be living here, I wondered. Was it the boy I was chasing? Was he hiding in the bushes somewhere nearby, afraid of getting caught? No. Whoever had been living at the site had been there for years, perhaps even decades. The camp was surrounded by dense palmetto bushes and a makeshift wall of driftwood. It was so well camouflaged that I realized I had already walked past it before falling down the hill. Hello, I said tentatively. There was no response. Sick of dust drawn from the nearby trees. I was about to leave when something along the far edge of camp caught my attention. It appeared to be a crude statue carved out of an old tree trunk and decorated with various objects. As I approached, its details came into focus. The statue depicted a humanoid figure with an alligator's head and a long, muscular tail, clearly meant to be the swamp wreck. There were various objects around it. Some had been laid at the creature's feet. A moldy tennis shoe, a broken compass, part of a child's lunchbox. Others were draped over its body a baseball cap, a canteen, a golden necklace bearing a cross. They were arrayed in a specific pattern, as if the statue was some kind of a shrine. I crept closer, almost mesmerized by the mysterious display. And that's when I saw it, a bracelet made of Lego blocks hanging around the statue's left wrist. My breath stopped, all noise faded. I reached out and grabbed the bracelet, the letters were faint, but still legible. M-O-O-K-I-E. This was the very bracelet I had given my older brother the day he disappeared. My skin felt prickly with fear and worry. I put the bracelet in my vest pocket, then turned around, looking in all directions. Mark! There was no response. The campsite was perfectly still. My eyes scanned the tent, the garden, the compost heap. The latrine, the, uh, a male figure, hidden in shadow, standing at the edge of the woods, motionless. I gasped. How long had he been there? It was too dark to make out the man's features. Could it be? Mark? Somehow I already knew the answer. There was a loud hisses. Then, very slowly, the figure stepped into the light. A six-foot-tall man mid to late fifties with a muscular frame and scraggly, graggy hair. A hermit, his wiry body was covered in dirt, mud, and bug bites, and he was completely naked. The hermit stared at me with bloodshot eyes, his expression unreadable, angry, scared, confused. My stomach wrenched with fear. Every alarm bell in my brain was ringing simultaneously. Kiss! So sorry, sorry, I stammered, backing away with my hands up. I didn't mean to. I can leave. The hermit opened his cracked lips to reveal rotten yellowed teeth. He hissed, producing a noise so low and resonant it sounded like a giant snake. I jumped back, falling on my behind at the foot of the shrine. No, please. But the hermit didn't attack. Instead, he grabbed something from within the tent something big. It looked like a pile of clothes. When he brought it out, I nearly screamed. It was a suit made of thick reptilian skin. The hermit had stitched together pieces of alligator hide to form a swamp rex costume. It had long sleeves that ended in clawed gloves, a hood made from a gator skull, webbed feet, even a tail. The monster suit was ugly as sin, but also intricate, terrifying, mesmerizing. The hermit started to put it on. 
His movements were slow and deliberate, like this was all part of some sort of ritual. What? What are you? I crawled backwards, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. My fingers brushed against a piece of driftwood, a potential weapon. The hermit stepped forward, wearing his swamp wreck suit. He looked like a mutant from the bowels of hell. The man hissed again, his voice amplified by the gator skull. It was louder, more guttural. I grabbed hold of the driftwood piece and stood up. The branch was small but solid, like a billy club. I raised it up defensively, and Mark's bracelet fell from my vest pocket. The hermit stared at the bracelet and hissed again. He took a step back. Cautiously, I picked up the bracelet with my free hand and held it out so the hermit could see it more clearly. It hung loosely from my fingertips. Where? Where did you get this? No response. Do you know Mark Brooks? I asked, trying to sound a bit more confident. With his gloved hand, the hermit pointed to the ceramic jar standing beneath the rain catcher. The ones that held water. I, I don't understand. Can you... can you speak? The hermit didn't say anything. He walked over to the jars, his reptilian hands brushing across the top of each one until he tipped the last jar over. Crash! A gallon of slimy liquid poured out, along with a pile of big white sticks. No. Not sticks. Bones. Inside the jar was a complete human skeleton, its bones all meshed together. Oh, F, I stammered. This was his answer. I was looking at Mark, spilled across the ground like some carnivore's leftovers. No, no, no. Hiss, the hermit raised his gloved hands. His eyes shined within the gator skull. My whole body shook. Sweat poured down my face. This was it, the end. I had my answer, and I would pay the ultimate price for it. Until I saw him, the boy who had run from the boardwalk so many hours ago. The one I'd been following. It was Mark, still 18 years old and wearing the same faded jeans and long-sleeved shirt from the night he disappeared. He looked at me, then pointed at something lying against the tent. A shotgun? I threw the driftwood at the hermit as hard as I could, then sprinted for the tent. Five feet, three, two, one. I grabbed the weapon with shaky hands. There was just enough time to turn. Bang! Blood splattered my face. The blast threw the hermit backwards. His six-foot-tall body fell to the ground with a thud. It all happened so fast, I didn't even realize I'd pulled the trigger until afterwards. Smoke curled from the barrel of the shotgun. I let out a sharp cry that was half cough, half sob. The hermit lay motionless a few feet away. I pumped the shotgun a second time as I stepped towards him, fingers still on the trigger. He never got up. Afterwards, I looked all over camp for my Mark's ghost, calling out his name. But aside from that split-second moment before the attack, I never saw my brother again. To this day, I wonder if I ever saw him at all. Perhaps it was all nerves. Perhaps my brother was just a manifestation of the my intense fear upon meeting the real swamp wrecks. Looking back, I'm struck by how similar the hermit's campsite was to the Swiss Family Robinson-style hallmark and I had imagined we'd live in when we were little. Aside from the obscene shrine and jars, of course. The police cordoned off the entire site the next day. Aside from Mark, they found the remains of 12 other people, even wealthy land developer Jerry Flagler. News vans came from all over. Word of the Swamp Rex's discovery spread internationally. Most importantly, our family finally had a proper burial for my brother that provided some much-needed closure. My parents and I wept for weeks on end. So far, the police have not been able to identify the hermit, even after analyzing dental records, completing a DNA profile, and sending his picture to various news outlets. There have been numerous theories, of course. Some said the hermit was Michael Jenkins, an escaped mental patient who vanished from a South Florida asylum 40 years ago, though the photos didn't bear much resemblance. Others claimed various serial killers who had never been caught, like the Zodiac. Some even believed the hermit was planted by the federal government to cover up the existence of the real creature. But no one came forward with any solid evidence. Nothing verifiable. 
The hermit has remained as mysterious as the swamp creature he had pretended to be for so many years. I've since moved clear across the country. I currently reside in the vast metropolis of Los Angeles. I don't go hiking anymore. I never go camping. I hardly ever even leave the house. But each night I dream. I dream that I'm still deep in that swamp, alone in my cold reptilian skin. I am the hermit, and the thing that worries me the most, I enjoy it. I could not sleep. It was 1, 41 a.m. I turned over to try to sleep. The next thing, my body went dead with no movement, nothing. There was no life in my body. My feet floated up and my whole body followed. I was floating upward. I could move my eyes. There was black all around me except for the lights floating past me. I could look from left to right. I looked straight up. There was a triangle-shaped object ahead of me. There were lights all under the object. I then blacked out. The next thing I know, I woke up in a dark room. They placed me on a table. All of a sudden, my whole body started vibrating from head to toe. I would make a groaning sound ever so often. I could not see them, but I know they were there. When I was placed back in my bed, I was waking up feeling like I had been unconscious. The next day, I was very tired. The whole week, I was tired. When I woke up the next morning, the thought of what had happened that night did not come to mind. I got in the shower and started praying the incident came back to me. It was so strong that it stopped my prayers. I was speechless. When they take you, you have no control. Sometimes you can see what is going on, and sometimes you can't. Ever since I can remember, I have been abducted many times before. They are just blocked out. Only in these last dozen years, I can remember some things about the abductions. I cannot remember the day or time, but this abduction was the one that changed me forever. This happened in 2014. I was watching television, and the next second the power went off all over the house. My TV has to reboot, so I didn't want to wait, and I just turned it off. The next thing I know, I was floating out of my room. When they were taking me, it was well lit. I was laying on a table, and they were standing on either side of me. There seemed to be one on the right side of my head as I was floating out from where they had taken me. I woke up in my bed. I still couldn't move my body, but I could move my head. I looked toward my bedroom door and saw the shadow of an alien. The head was large. The arms were long and thin. The hands were thin with long, thin fingers. I yelled out because I thought it was my son. I kept calling his name, and no one answered. When I first yelled out, the alien stood still. He did not move. I started to get frustrated because I thought it was my son, and I wasn't getting an answer. The next minute, there was a flash of light coming from where the being was standing, and he was gone. I got up and went to my son's room, and he was asleep. It wasn't him who cast that shadow. The next morning, I was on the road in front of my job. There was a sheriff's car parked between two buses. I drove on into the parking lot and was backing up to park. There was only one car parked on the left of me. I started texting my daughter a message. I looked up. There were two joggers running right next to my car. They ran so close they could have hit my car. They ran together as if they were sewn together. I could not see their faces. I never saw them coming or going. It hasn't happened since. It was kind of strange for that to happen. After my abduction, I have an allergic reaction to something they used on me. I have had posterior bleeding and severe pain in my female organs. The pain is so severe I can't walk and it travels from there to my rear. I have seen apparitions. I have seen dark figures in my room. I have had ear ringing when certain aircraft fly over. I see flashes of light at night when I'm out. I have learned to ignore them. I can be driving and don't know how I got from point A to B. My daughter would hear strange noises coming from my room, like operating room sounds. My TV would turn itself off sometimes. It's been nine years and I still suffer the horrific effects of that one abduction. I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. 
This abduction occurred in January 2014. So I'm a 25 years old female and this strange thing happened to me just this afternoon. I often take nice and relaxing strolls through the forest on Sundays together with my dad, which is some kind of tradition since my childhood and today was no exception. Sometimes my uncle joins us on those strolls, and today he did so too. We walked down one of our usual paths, and at a split of the path we met some old man my dad had, and uncle obviously knew. The man was walking the opposite direction back towards the village. They did some small talk, and then we headed further along the path through the forest, my dad and uncle being a bit ahead of me, and talking to each other while I took some photos of the beautiful nature around us, in the process walking a bit slower than them and stopping a few times. There were a few times I was a good distance behind them, which at that point I didn't realize that it could have been dangerous. At some point on the path, we turned to head back home, and as we walked a bit, I stopped for a moment to take a picture of the trees next to the path. Then after taking the picture, I, for some reason, looked a bit left and was absolutely shocked the moment I turned my head, because farther in the forest, leaned against one of the trees, stood that old man we'd met before, absolutely still, just staring intensely back at me without any movement and without saying a word. After the initial shock, I decided to just look away and keep on walking, not daring to look behind us most of the way back. I didn't tell my father or uncle about it, but it was just such a weird experience. What scares me the most about it is that I don't have any real explanation as to why that man had been following us, and even more, why he was doing so not on the path, but just within the forest. And if he didn't have anything creepy in mind, why he didn't say anything but just stare. I'm just so glad that I wasn't walking alone. This happened almost 15 years ago when I was seven. My best friend's mom would babysit my brother and I before and after school. My mom would usually drop us off at her house around 6 a.m., she would make us breakfast, and the three of us would walk to our elementary that was less than ten minutes away. For preface, we would walk through an adjacent neighborhood, through this small wooded area that had an enclosed bridge, and that led us to the back of our elementary. The elementary sits back in a long tree line that runs about half a mile north and another mile south. Anyways, we're about to get to the turn where we walk into the tree line to the bridge, and this guy comes cruising down the street. At first, I don't even think we noticed him, considering how young we were, but right when he's about ten feet away from us, he slows down to virtually zero miles per hour. There was nothing that stood out about his appearance, either. He was middle-aged, white male, very generic. Well, we all stare at the car and start walking super slowly. If we stop, he would stop. If we walk, he would slowly go. During this whole ordeal, he has a blank expression on his face. Not anger, no smirk, just this sinister deadness almost. This went on for probably five minutes because we were too scared he'd jump out of the car if we turned our backs on him and I was mainly scared for my little brother. Finally, he speeds off and we run the rest of the way to school. Immediately go to the principal's office and at this point we are bawling. We gave them our version of the story, his description, and whatever else a seven-year-old is actually capable of giving. They take action by calling the cops and our parents. The cops come and we explain where it happened and the story again. Then our parents ended up taking us out of school. From then on, we weren't allowed to walk to school anymore and our babysitter would take us. The reason this ended up being so creepy is because apparently there had been reports around that time of a guy who would sit under the bridge. We walked over right by the school and watched people. They didn't know if he was homeless or if it was this other guy who we encountered. They never caught the guy and we never saw him again. Whether this was a more sinister encounter than we thought or he was just bored, we will never know. I do know how bizarre it was, though. 
who stares at children that intently while driving by. He even turned his head around as he was driving. By his chance of luck, no other cars drove by during this whole situation. But weirdo driver, let's not ever meet again. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.